Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to the second day of our final event for the Decarbonizing Transport in Europe project. Today we have two sessions. Uh, the first session will be on non-urban passenger transport, while the second session will be on non-urban freight sector. So uh, just before we start, just a few guidelines. Um, uh, for example, I, I would like to ask all of you to, uh, I would like to ask the participants to keep yourself muted if you're not speaking and if you do not, if you have not uh, received the floor. Um, to, the, to the audience, please keep an eye on the chat where some useful information and links will be given. And I want to remind you that there is a Q&A function. So by clicking the Q&A um, the Q&A button, you can write up your questions to speakers and organizers. Uh, I would encourage you to do so while people are already presenting or talking, but the questions will be answered at the end on a specific Q&A session. Now, with that, uh, I would like to give the floor to our moderator, Jagoda Egeland from the ITF, uh, to start this first session. Thank you, Jagoda. Thank you very much, Dimitris. Uh, good morning, everybody um, from rainy Paris. Um, this is a session um, uh, on uh, non-urban um, uh, passenger travel, uh, very much uh, focusing on uh, the aviation sector and how to uh, decarbonize it. And we are ready uh, for uh, takeoff. Um, the session is uh, essentially uh, divided up um, into uh, three parts. In the first part, uh, we will hear um, uh, from um, experts um, um, on um, important details underpinning uh, the discussion. Uh, first, uh, Andras Schaefer, uh, who's a professor um, at the University College London, uh, where he is holding um, uh, the chair in energy and transport, will tell us more on uh, decarbonizing uh, non-urban passenger transport in Europe. Uh, and then our team uh, here at the ITF uh, Dimitris uh, Papayoanu and Jonathan Leap uh, will tell us more about uh, DTEU scenarios, um, their development and results. So that's part one. Please bear with us. Uh, then we will have a discussion uh, among um, uh, the experts um, whom we invited. Uh, Rolf Diemer is a head of economic unit at DG Move. Mark Emi is vice president of corporate affairs at Airbus. Angelo Martino is a partner and chairman at TRT Transporti e Territorio. And finally, last but not least, I was going alphabetical, Monique van Fortel is a national expert uh, at Shift to Rail. So we will have a panel discussion. Uh, we are very um, excited about having that. And then finally, we will have a Q&A with yourself, so the participants to this workshop. So while we are going through our discussions and presentations, please think about the questions that you would like to ask us and we will do our best to ask these questions and get answers uh, that you would like to hear. So without further ado, Andres, the floor is yours to deliver your presentation. Thank you, Jagoda, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, let me see whether I can get this presentation up and running. Um, Okay, that should do the trick. Let's minimize that. Okay, um, thank you very much, Jagoda. It's um, it's always a pleasure being with uh, you and your colleagues, uh, even on a virtual basis. Um, so um, I was asked to give a a perspective on on the topic that I don't have to repeat here, and I have no intention to reproduce and and you know. Uh, go again into details of uh, what the ITF has been doing in their study so uh, competently. Um, instead, I'm, I'm going to give you a sort of high level perspective of- Andreas, uh, sorry to interrupt. We can, can you share again? Something that must have happened and we cannot see your presentation oh, at the moment. Okay. Yeah, apologies. Um, let me see. It worked fine then. Yes, it was probably a storm uh, in the channel. Okay, it works now. Great. Okay, Thank excellent. You. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, I'm I'm not going to um, 
uh, repeat what the ITF has done so, um, so well in the report, I'm, I'm giving you a, a sort of high level perspective of uh, how I think about this topic. Um, so um, this, is, this is all I have to, I'm, I'm planning to talk about and then I'm going to back it up with a few pictures um, afterwards. Um, so let's, let's start with the challenges before we move to the opportunities and decarbonization pathways. The uh, transportation sector is a sector of enormous scale and it keeps growing both in absolute terms but also relative to other sectors of the energy system. And that's simply a consequence of economic growth. Uh, as you grow the economy, um, there's a structural shift from agriculture to industry to services, transportation being a service sector. So this does not come as a surprise. And also within the transportation sector, we see significant shifts, especially in the non-urban part as uh, travelers shift from surface transportation modes, predominantly automobiles to high-speed modes particularly aircraft. And this is not a, a problem by itself because aircraft have become so fuel efficient over time, but, but the challenge there is how to get the carbon out of the aircraft now because it's so much more difficult in this sector as compared to automobiles that you can quite comfortably um, uh, electrify uh, these days. Um, another challenge are the long time constants that um, underlie the sector. Um, well, we are all aware that uh, automobile lifetimes are around 15 years. This means after 15 years, half of the fleet has turned over, but, but the lifetimes are around twice as high for aircraft. This means those aircraft being purchased today, half of those will still be operating in 2050. Um, this was the operational side from the manufacturer side. The transportation sector is a very capital intensive industry meaning if you uh, develop a new automobile, you, you, know, you invest three to five billion dollars or euros. Um, if you invest into a new aircraft, you can pay you know, as much as four times as that. And that's an enormous risk. Um, and the risk is getting it wrong and the, you know, your vehicle doesn't operate as you intended to. And, and as a result of that, uh, industry manages, manages that risk by, by um, you know, not changing too many components at the same time. Uh, rather base your new, your, your new vehicle on a proven design. And this of course prevents technological progress um, uh, compared to a situation in which that, that capital intensity related risk didn't exist. Now looking at the, at the drivers of technological change, um, we have seen enormous progress in terms of energy efficiency improvements in the past uh, with, with, with respect to some of the sect, uh, some parts of the sector. Um, and there we have to distinguish between the private transportation and commercial transportation. And the fundamental difference here is that in commercial transportation, um, companies maximize the profit and profit maximization also means minimizing costs. And in the transportation sector, of course, minimizing transportation costs. This means introducing fuel saving technologies to the extent it's cost effective, but also exploiting economies of scale. And this economies of scale ambition in the past has, has generated enormous benefits and introduced radically different technologies. And I'll show you one example on that. Um, in contrast, uh, in private transportation, humans, they don't minimize costs. Otherwise we would you know, interact only as, as today via Zoom or, or Skype or any other communication platform and do our travel mainly on foot. We maximize utility and cost is important, but it's only one of the attributes. Other important ones are comfort, safety, flexibility, independence and so forth. And as a result, energy intensity would have increased in, in passenger tra in private transportation if we had not uh, uh, introduced valuable fuel saving technologies. So we already in the past had to compensate that increase in energy intensity through, uh, through expensive valuable technological solutions that, that we don't have available now anymore because we introduced them already so we 
that the potential for fuel efficiency improvements is declining. Now, what, what can we do about it? Well, as, as the ITF report has, has nicely shown, there is no single solution. We have to bring all options to the table. And even then, you, you are constrained, as the analysis uh, by the ITF nicely shows. Um, I'm, I'm going to focus only on one opportunity, which is the key one, namely the reduction of the CO2 intensity of the transportation fuels. Uh, historically, we have um, operated with oil products for very good reasons because of the wide availability, manageable cost, you can store it, very high energy content per unit weight and volume and so forth. Wasn't there the CO2 emissions problem, we would continue with them. Um, so we haven't utilized that in the past and that's the key opportunity. Um, if we move to alternative fuels, hydrogen will play a key role, whether directly or indirectly, indirectly through the production of synthetic alternative fuels. And if we do this on a low carbon basis, then there will be a heavy reliance on renewable power or nuclear power. Good news is that renewable power has uh, costs have, have decreased significantly and are projected to continue to do that. Um, now, the, the new situation then, once, we, once the transportation sector becomes increasingly dependent on electricity, either directly or indirectly, is that we need to step back and have a, a, you know, a multi-sector whole energy system perspective, because there are a number of interactions and trade-offs what should we do with biofuels? Is the biomass uh, better suited to transform it into liquid fuels or should it be used uh, for power generation, ideally in a you know, BEX uh, situation, which means biomass energy carbon capture and storage. So we grow the biomass, it ex extracts the CO2 from the atmosphere, we burn it in a power plant to generate electricity, but at the same time, we, uh, we, we uh, um, capture the CO2 emissions and depose them, uh, dispose them. So on a net basis, um, we would uh, reduce the CO2 intensity or the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Um, an increasing amount of end use sectors is going to draw on renewable power, partly for the reasons I just mentioned. Also, there's the opportunity for uh, load leveling uh, the, uh, the power, the power uh, curve, electricity curve through using uh, vehicles now uh, as a way to balance the demand in the residential and industry sector, for example. So there will be much more interference compared to the traditional setting in which, uh, you know, the gasoline fraction of a refinery goes to passenger cars, the diesel to trucks and, and buses, to some extent also to cars, of course, more recently, and the fuel oil goes to, to ships and the like and households or industry. So, um, that's, that's uh, the key messages I wanted to convey and, and now a couple of pictures uh, for, uh, for your entertainment. So just a, a way to uh, make, aware, make us aware of the scale of the transportation system. Um, each of these icons is a nuclear reactor. And if you counted them, then you would uh, end up at around 131. I mean, that's the number of nuclear reactors that exist in Europe, uh, or existed in 2018, which is the EU 28 plus the EA countries plus Switzerland. Another question is how many additional nuclear reactors would you need in order to produce hydrogen that would then uh, um, displace the um, uh, oil products used in the transportation sector on only in road transportation on an energy equivalent basis. And, and we've got very regular assumptions with respect to how much electricity you need, 50 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. So the answer is in Europe, you would need 741 nuclear reactors. That's the scale of our transportation system. And, and as you see, um, it, it's measured at 15 bars, so we don't even take into account the compression to a, to a storage pressure you know, of around 350 bars or so, then you can add another 5 to 10 percent, so around 800 nuclear reactors. That's the energy equivalent um, amount of hydrogen that we need uh, to produce. Um, then, uh, you know, we, we, we talked about the, the long time constants. 
Um, this is a rather simplistic uh, picture. I had no time to enter the raw data this from, from my class lecture here. Um, you, you see that uh, transportation is actually not doing that badly. Um, automobiles are the blue and the left and, and aircraft are the next. Um, it could be much worse if you look at the housing stock or industrial plants, but again, um, half of those aircraft being introduced today they will still be operating in 2050, which is of course a constraint, especially if we need to shift uh, to hydrogen as an energy carrier. Now, uh, with respect to technological change, and I mentioned that um, economies of scale was a key driver in the past. Econ economies of scale meaning that you increase the output and the unit costs decline. And this is what you see here in terms of uh, freight transportation system. That's a uh, chart uh, that was compiled by a former PhD student uh, uh, of mine. And what you see on the Y scale is the operating cost. So the unit costs, how many dollars per revenue ton kilometers. And, and on, the, on the X axis, you've got the revenue ton kilometers divided by vehicle kilometers traveled, which is the number of revenue tons carried per vehicle. And the larger the transportation system, the lower the unit cost. So that's a perfect example of economies of scale. Now, what has happened over time, if we look at the lower right and with respect to the ships, they have become bigger and bigger in order to exploit economies of scale. And that's a depiction of the, of the largest uh, ship around. Now, ships were not the only sector in which economies of scale uh, have materialized. Um, a nice example are also railroads. And uh, there we have perhaps seen the most radical technological change at the fastest pace ever observed. This is an example uh, of the US railroad system. We start in the first half of the 19th century when they were first introduced. The Y scale shows the fuel shares and we see that, that wood accounted for uh, uh, virtually all of the uh, uh, railroad transportation fuel. And, and the reason was there was a need for agricultural land and lots of forests, so the, the, the forests were cleared and wood was very cheap. Um, then after the uh, Civil War, there was a transition to coal because the low cost wood was, was running out. But then at around 1900, we observed that fuel oil has uh, uh, gradually entered the market for two main reasons, uh, mainly because of coal miner strikes, which were big disruptions and even uh, steam locomotive companies uh, that owned their own coal mine have shifted partly to fuel oil as a precautionary measure and also because of the spark problem that uh, you know sparks were flying out of the chimney and, and were setting alight lots of infrastructure along the railroad lines that were that resulted in costly lawsuits. Now then something important happened at around 1950 within only 10 years there was a complete switch from, from steam uh, locomotives to diesel electric locomotives. And the key reason was economies of scale because you, you could not make the railroads, uh, the, the, the steam locomotives particularly larger. They have already become extremely large, but any further increase would have jeopardized the structural in integrity of bridges. The clearance in tunnels was not large enough anymore. So you had to find a different solutions, solution and diesel locomotives were the, the, the obvious answer. Also, they were significantly more capital intensive than, than steam locomotives. But in this case, you could switch several of them um, in, in series and only have one crew. You could also do this with steam locomotives, but each steam locomotive would have still have to have its driver and, and fireman. So there was a limit. Now, this was a real revolution um, because those uh, companies who have never ever uh, uh, designed the steam locomotives, they went out and dominated the market, namely General Electrics and Electric uh, Motor Division of General Motors. And those companies that uh, spend lots of time before on uh, designing steam locomotives, they all went out of business. So that, that might be also a, uh, a, a uh, thing to, to uh, remember uh, for transitions that may occur in the uh, transportation sector. Today, and remember Elon Musk, how he has disrupted the system and how uh, the incumbents are lagging behind in terms of uh, producing their, or working on their response. 
So um, this was the, the uh, commercial transportation sector with respect to uh, private transportation. Uh, I mentioned before that energy intensity has actually or would have gone in the other direction, I mean increase, because cost is only one element and there are many other factors consumers care about like comfort, safety and, and so forth. Um, this is perhaps an extreme example, but we see the first generation mini and one of the last ones these are completely different automobiles. And if we look at the right chart that plots uh, fuel consumption over the, the vehicle weight, then uh, the current model is, is this uh, rectangular uh, area and uh, it depends on the, on the specs on the vehicle that you, that you are looking at. But if we compare it to, a, to the 1964 model using today's data, then we see that um, it, it, it would only consume half as much. Now, guess what? The fuel consumption of these two models is roughly identical. And, the, uh, and, and this, this demonstrates you know, the engineering marvel that, that uh, has been generated. But at the same time, um, if, if, if the, you know, the weight hadn't changed, the dimension hadn't changed, um, we could have used the technology to go to a significantly lower levels of fuel consumption. So where are we today? This is a, a picture with respect to freight transportation. I know it's a passenger transportation session, but I think it's, it's a good reference point to where we are in passenger transportation. Um, what we see here is energy intensity on the Y scales. How many megajoules do we need to generate one revenue ton kilometer or to move one ton that generates revenue over a distance of one kilometer? On the X scale again, we've got how many uh, tons are carried per vehicle, revenue ton kilometers over vehicle kilometers traveled. That's the product of the load factor and of the capacity of the vehicle. We see four modes, trucks, aircraft, railways, and water vessels. And we see that as, as the scale increases, as the, the more tons we carry per vehicle, um, the lower the energy intensity. This is a consequence of two factors, namely that energy intensity declines with increasing load factor, energy use increases, megajoules per vehicle kilometer traveled, but the load factor increases faster or more strongly, so the energy intensity declines. And the other component is that the energy intensity also declines with the capacity because of the square cube law. As we increase the size of a body, the volume grows more strongly than the surface area. If you look at an engine, for example, the engine output, the power is related to the volume. The losses are related to the surface area, which is friction and heat transfer, which means that as we grow the engine, the power output increases more strongly than the losses, which means the vehicle is getting more efficient. So bigger is better, um, everything else constant. And a similar uh, thought applies to, to the uh, carrying capacity of the vehicle. Aircraft at a given uh, scale is the most energy intensive mode in freight. That's, that's not a surprise. It operates at 10 times the speed. Um, and we also see that, that uh, you know, it's, it makes a huge difference with respect to trucks, how large they are in terms of energy intensity. And, and as, you, as you move along the line, you will not be able uh, from a certain point on to compensate uh, the increase in energy intensity through technological measures anymore. <coughs> Interestingly, perhaps, um, you know, these, these uh, uh, behavioral socioeconomic forces that drive our system towards higher energy intensity in private, trans pri pri private transport, sorry, may also apply to truck uh, transportation. If you think about increasing home deliveries, uh, just in time inventory management and so forth, which drives our freight transportation system towards smaller vehicles, should at one point also increase the average uh, the, the, uh, the sorry, the, uh, reduce the size of the of the average truck fleet, and as a result, increase the energy intensity. Okay, let's move to passenger transport, and and what we observe here, it's it's completely different ball game here. Uh, air transportation is is now able to exploit the uh, economies of scale, if you wish, with respect to energy intensity, and are operating very much within the same range of energy intensities as automobiles and buses in general. Um, uh, intercity buses, uh, as we know from many other studies, they are typically the, 
uh, lowest energy intensive modes. But we have to be very careful when we compare here the energy intensities because the service quality is so different. With aircraft, you operate again at 10 times the vehicle speed. Um, and and uh, uh, this, this alone makes a complete difference. With automobiles, of course, you've got much more privacy and, and, and comfort. Um, perhaps also interesting is that aircraft are aligned with uh, railroads, as you see, uh, in terms of energy intensity. Railroads are these, these black uh, stars here on the right. I'm not sure whether you can see this when I move my cursor, but, but these are railroads and, and aircraft are perfectly uh, aligned with them, despite the much higher speed. But so, so again, the shift towards air transportation is not the issue. The, the, the associated problem is then how to get the carbon out of air transportation, which is more difficult to do. So what can we do about it? There are many options. I, everybody who has not looked at the ITF study, I encourage to do so because they look very carefully at each of these determinants of CO2 emissions. In the remaining few minutes, um, I will uh, look at the fuel composition, which determines the CO2 emissions that are released as we oxidize the fuel. Um, here we distinguish between carbon neutral fuels and zero carbon fuels and carbon neutral fuels are those fuels that, um, uh, that undergo a life cycle with respect to the CO2 emissions that are then either absorbed by biomass plantations and the biomass is then um, converted to, to a liquid fuel again and, and the cycle is closed or in terms of direct air capture, the CO2 is captured from the atmosphere and then in addition to hydrogen uh, transformed into a liquid fuel. Um, in contrast, zero carbon fuels like electricity and hydrogen, uh, they are more operating on a, on a linear uh, uh, um, trajectory. <coughs> Excuse me. So what, what can we do? Well, for battery electric, uh, uh, battery electric uh, technology is of course suitable for automobiles and for urban buses and, and trucks. Uh, with respect to biofuels, they have limited uh, scalability. So we need to look at these uh, alternatives, uh, low carbon uh, uh, fuels, um, hydrogen either directly, synthetic, fuel in, synthetic fuels indirectly. There are good reasons for either of them um, both of them are highly complementary in terms of their advantages. I don't, I don't go through this in detail. Um, a prerequisite for getting either of the fuels um, uh, scaled up at the scale we need, and I showed you this, this picture at the beginning with the requirements for uh, uh, power in terms of a nuclear example, is, is low electricity costs. And the good news here is that uh, we have experienced a strong decline in these costs. And uh, most recently, uh, the Aldafra uh, solar power project in Abu Dhabi, the auction price was 1.35 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's, that's almost for free. And this is a real prerequisite for, uh, again, for producing uh, these uh, fuels at scale. Um, and again, the last point I wanted to make again is the energy sector now is becoming increasingly interdependent. We cannot afford to look only at the transportation sector anymore. Um, again, it's the dependence on renewable electricity. The load leveling opportunity provided by, by uh, uh, electric vehicles, uh, the average household energy consumption is 10 kilowatt hours per day in, in the EU roughly. Uh, the average size of an electric car battery is, you know, 35, 40 to 100 kilowatt hours per day. So you see that's an enormous opportunity for these vehicles to provide some grid storage. And uh, of course, again, the biofuel versus um, uh, burning the uh, biomass in power plants and uh, sequestering the CO2 emissions. And here I am again, and I won't uh, go through this uh, and read it off again. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andreas, for this great overview of the challenges uh, that we face when thinking mm -hmm. about decarbonizing the sector. It was fantastic to go back to first principles and, and look at those. So thank you very much uh, for this overview. And thank you for including only one equation and an equation that we could all understand. So thank you very much for that as well. Um, and now um, from challenges and a recap of where we should be looking, we will go um, into 
DTEU scenarios. Uh, I just wanted to tell all of the participants that we will take questions um, uh, about this presentation after Dimitris and Jonathan uh, deliver theirs. So we will take all the questions together, uh, but please feel free to already uh, send those to us. We will pick up on them, uh, I can promise you that. Uh, and without further ado, uh, Dimitris, Jonathan, the floor is yours to deliver a presentation on DTEU scenarios. Thank you very much, Yagoda. Uh, good morning once again. So now we will go on and we will talk about the work that we did uh, in the ITF on the non-urban passenger sector. Uh, first of all, let me give you some uh, information about the scope of our work. Uh, some of a lot of this was uh, discussed yesterday to a presentation of my colleague Luis Martinez when he went into detail about the model. So we're not going to talk so much about that. But very briefly, uh, the non-urban passenger model of the ITF covers all uh, activity that happens outside of urban areas. And that is split in two. That is split in activity that happens uh, intercity between urban areas and also activity that happens regionally. Uh, trips that occur in rural areas or outside urban areas but are not between cities. Uh, this is done with uh, five modes. Two of them are only for intercity. Those are air and ferry. Overall, we have aviation, rail transport, private vehicle transport, buses, and ferries. Uh, as we said yesterday, we have two main scenarios that we tested, which were designed together with the participants of the previous workshop, which took place in uh, April. We have the current ambition and the high ambition scenario. Now, um, what does this mean for, uh, for non-urban transport? Uh, Current ambition can be as uh, can be outlined as the policies that uh, government stakeholders have already agreed upon or are very committed in pursuing in the future. High ambition, on the other hand, is about scaling up those ambitions, scaling up those policies, and being and create and putting in place uh, policies, measures, developing infrastructures that have a strong um, that have as that that aim very strongly to decarbonize transport. Now, uh, overall, we have over all the models of ITF, we have 53 measures and trends. Obviously, not all of them apply for non-urban passenger transport. Here is a brief overview of the measures that we have in the non-urban passenger sector. I'm not going to go all of them. You can see they are grouped in some categories. Next, I'm going to give you some examples of these measures and how they differ between the current and the high ambition um, scenarios. Now let's start with all electric aircraft. So all electric air aircraft discusses about a potentially revolutionary development for the aviation sector that would ensure a zero, a zero tailpipe emission aviation. Uh, of course, this is something that currently uh, we cannot talk about commercial use, but in the time frame of this uh, of this work of this uh, of this study, they could become viable. So in the current ambition, we can see that. Um, uh, electric aircraft achieve a thousand kilometer flying range in 2050 and their cost of operating is about 50 percent more than a conventional aircraft whereas in the high ambition these figures are slightly elevated slightly more ambitious 1500 uh, 1500 kilometers and 1.2 the operating cost uh, another thing that we have is a trend that falls under the trends category it's a reduced propensity to fly uh, this is particularly um, evident in Europe, we already see some people who are declaring they like to reduce their flying. Uh, this is a trend that we have to take into account. Um, generally, this is related with um, environmental concerns. So there is also a connection that as uh, the air sector becomes more low on carbon, this will apply for fewer and fewer people for fewer flights. So this percent of flights only applies to uh, flights with carbon, with a carbon footprint. So as you can see, there is a difference between the current ambition and the high ambition. Uh, I just want to point out that this model is a global model. So therefore, uh, it's not modeling only movements in Europe or within Europe, but also around the world. 
So that means that we also have different values for these policy measures in different areas, different regions around the world. Values which came through a survey that the ITF conducted with stakeholders from uh, across the globe. Now, another policy measure, it's a very popular one, has been discussed over and over these past uh, this, this few days, but also these days in general, is carbon pricing, which would put a, a cost in the produced carbon that comes from fuel burn. This would apply for all modes, of course, and it would be as an incentive for uh, both individual and companies to reduce their carbon footprint and accelerate the adoption of low carbon technologies. Now, on the current ambition, the cost that we are assuming for Europe is 250 uh, USD per ton of emitted CO2. And whereas in the high ambition, this cost would be uh, 500 USD. Now, moving on, another, another measure that we have, uh, it's a regulatory instrument, it's fuel mandates for aviation, which require which require airlines to use a certain percentage, a minimum percentage of sustainable aviation fuel, regardless of their type. Uh, this could, uh, this is a measure that would accelerate the adoption of this fuel even before they become cost competitive. So based on the responses that the attendees of the previous workshop uh, had given, uh, we see uh, at the current ambition scenario, 10% of the fuel in 2050 would be mandated to be sustainable, whereas in the high ambition, this would switch to 25%. Now, of course, we are not only talking about aviation, we also have other modes. Uh, of course, uh, because of the nature of the sector, there is a lot of weight going in aviation, but nonetheless, uh, rail is a key solution in order to reduce emissions in the non-urban transport. So investments in infrastructure and operation uh, would drastically improve the competitiveness of rail and make it uh, as an attractive alternative for users in the distances where it makes sense. Now, uh, this is a policy measure that bundles a bunch of, uh, a bunch of different policies, but due to the nature of the model, we only uh, we can model the result of these policies. So in the current ambition, these policies result in a frequency increase by 2040, whereas in the high ambition, there is a combination of frequency increase and a speed increase for conventional rail. The speed increase does not apply for high-speed rail services. Uh, there is also another policy measure which falls under the mobility as a service category regulatory still. It's about multimodality, uh, having the ability for people to travel using different modes. So, uh, and of course, we already travel, if you take it strictly uh, from the point of view of a trip starting from door to door, we already use multiple modes. But this talks about the ability, for example, of someone to take a bus to go to a different city, then take a plane, and then finally take a train to reach their final destinations. So through different policies and regulation, this can be encouraged, allowing people to, uh, making it easier to travel through different modes. And this can be done through central, uh, intermodal uh, transfer stations or uh, allowing people to book a, fly, uh, book a trip containing different uh, modes at the same time. So the result again is modeled. Uh, in the current ambition, uh, transferring between modes has a two times penalty, time, time consuming penalty, it's reflected as uh, time spent compared when traveling with the same mode. Whereas in the high ambition, it actually is less consuming as transferring the same mode to stimulate the seamlessness of, of switching modes. Now, as I said, these are only some of the measures that we have. Uh, and now we're going to go into the results and the analysis that was done. And for that, I will pass the floor to my colleague, Jonathan Leap. Jonathan. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Demetrius, um, not only for setting the stage for me here, but also for your work developing the model. Um, I got to swoop in here at the, for the fun part of analyzing the results. Um, so let's take a look at what the model actually tells us about the efficacy of, of these measures that Demetrius uh, described for us. Um, so looking at the back of this graph, which I think is familiar to most of us by now, um, I'd like to first highlight the importance of non-urban travel um, in the broader effort to decarbonize transport. So this graph shows us the total emissions by sector um, and non-urban passenger is here in light green. 
And if we look first at 2015, uh, we can see that the non-urban passenger um, travel sector accounted for more than half of transport emissions. If we look ahead to 2050, that share grows to 60 to 70 percent, um, even as the absolute value of emissions falls. So in short, non-urban passenger is lagging behind the other uh, transport sectors um, in its pathway to carbon neutrality. Um, so if we again focus on 2050, you're, you can also notice that there's a huge difference in emissions between uh, the current ambition and the high ambition scenarios. Um, and so whether or not Europe achieves um, its, its emissions targets, um, for example, the 60% reduction from 1990 levels, this depends very largely on how quickly we can decarbonize non-urban travel. Um, so without undermining progress in other sectors, particularly urban sectors, uh, we do need to ramp up efforts to decarbonize non-passenger uh, travel. Um, so one reason that non-urban travel will be difficult to decarbonize is because demand is forecasted to grow uh, quite persistently, actually. So as most of us um, tuned into this event from our homes, uh, it's no surprise that uh, here in 2020, um, activity has shrunk by 50%. Um, however, at ITF, we expect that demand is going to recover in about five years, uh, you know, once vac vaccination rolls out and economies recover. And from that point onward, it's going to grow consistently. Um, so if we look ahead to 2050, uh, with the policies currently in place, we're going to see activity increase by about 28% over 2015 levels. Um, the high ambition policies that we've proposed could actually bring that demand uh, growth down to 18%, but it's not actually able to reduce activity. Um, so as Andreas already highlighted in the opening uh, session today, we need low carbon and zero carbon fuels and technologies to really decarbonize this sector. Go ahead, Demetrius, yeah. So uh, if we break down the results by subsector, um, that helps us sort of pinpoint where we can focus our efforts. Um, so if we look at regional travel first in light blue, uh, which again includes these like peri-urban trips, um, we can see that it accounts for just under about half of the activity in 2015. Um, and we see that doesn't really change much as we look ahead to 2050. Um, so the other uh, subsectors, uh, which represent intercity travel, however, um, do grow significantly in both scenarios. And so if we look at international air travel in particular, so that's shown here in light green, um, it's poised to more than double by 2050. So fortunately, the high emission scenario helps divert some of those shorter trips uh, to rail, for example. Um, but demand for international aviation remains pretty strong in both scenarios. So next slide, Demetrius, yeah, great. Um, sorry, let's look at the map, yeah, great. So, um, so in this map here, we have, um, we have little plots in each region that show um, the activity in interregional travel um, in 2015, and then in 2050 for the two scenarios. Um, and so if we look at 2015 first, we can see that most activity is happening between Europe um, and Asia, the Middle East and North America. But if we look ahead to 2050, we can see, so this is now the middle bar, um, we can see that the tables are going to turn and um, places like Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa um, are going to have much higher levels of activity um, in terms of travel between Europe um, and these regions. And, but if we look uh, ahead to the third bar, which is a high ambition scenario, we can see that it's able to reduce activity um, a bit across the board, uh, but we're still going to see a, a pretty large uptick in, in interregional travel. So let's move on to Okay, so let's look at emissions here. Um, so we remember that activity um, in both scenarios was still growing, um, but fortunately it, it, our model suggests that we are able to actually decarbonize not urban passenger um, while still accommodating this increase in demand. Um, so while the high ambition policies, they only reduced 2050 activity by 8% below the current ambition projections, um, they actually cut forecasted emissions by 67%. So that's this gap here between the, the blue and the green lines here at 2050. And you'll notice if you zoom in on the green line a little bit that emissions fall most rapidly between 2025 and 2040, uh, which we think is a really critical period um, for rolling out 
some of these uh, nation sort of low carbon technologies that are still under development right now. So again, if we look by subsector, um, but this time at emissions, um, that gives us some more insight. So if we look first at uh, surface transport in these the two uh, blue shades here in the map, we can see that emissions uh, are already set to decline, even in the current ambition scenario, uh, but they'll decline much further in high ambition. Um, but the problem is that these very actually heroic uh, sort of reductions that we're foreseeing um, in surface transport could very easily be offset uh, by, by increased emissions from international air travel um, if we fail to decarbonize that subsector. So go ahead, Demetrius, yeah. Great, so slicing the data a pretty similar way, this, uh, in this case by, um, by trip distance, um, that, that allows us to, uh, to pinpoint even more precisely where the, the potential problem is. And so if we look in the royal blue at, at the top, um, these are trips over 2,000 kilometers, so long haul trips. And in 2015, they're generating about 20%, a little less than 20% of emissions. But if we look ahead to 2050, they're gonna account for uh, nearly 60% of emissions from non-urban travel. And so I look forward to hearing from Mark and me about Airbus's plans to develop um, zero carbon aircraft for these types of trips. Uh, we know that's, that's quite a challenge. Next. Um, so moving on to equity, as Andreas explains, um, using the, the example of the switch uh, of trains in the U United States from uh, coal to diesel, any type of change in the transport sector is inevitably going to create some winners and some losers. Um, and, and so Europe's pathway to carbon neutrality, um, I think, will only garner political support insofar as it's perceived as fair and equitable um, moving forward. So equity is a complicated topic. Um, it can be assessed by many dimensions. We could look at it by age, uh, race, income. Um, but due to the nature of our models, we are pretty limited to looking at equity um, in terms of geography, the sort of the spatial uh, distribution um, of, of carbon emissions and the, the costs of decarbonization measures. Um, so first we calculate a Gini coefficient um, for carbon emissions. And that allows us to quantify sort of the uneven distribution of per capita emissions. And what we find is that um, in some parts of Europe, uh, especially sort of central and West Europe, um, the per capita emissions are currently much higher from non-urban transport. Um, but we f what we find is that this disparity will actually uh, diminish over time and the decarbonization measures will accelerate that sort of evening out of per capita emissions. Um, the second thing we looked at was, was actually the cost of these decarbonization measures. Um, and so what we did was we calculated the consumer surplus, um, uh, the difference in consumer surplus between the high ambition and current ambition scenarios. And what we find is that the more stringent sort of economic and regulatory measures, um, they take the social cost of climate change and they translate into a direct cost for the users who are emitting this carbon. And as a result, um, the direct costs go up for some people. Um, and pretty much across Europe, uh, there is a, a loss of consumer surplus in the high emission scenario around 2030. But what's, what's interesting is we see that uh, loss in consumer surplus dissipate by 2050 as these low carbon technologies penetrate the market um, and provide low cost and low carbon travel. So next, Demetrius. Um, so just to give you guys a sense of what uh, these, of how these per capita emissions are distributed in Europe. Um, so we have this map here. Again, these bar plots show 2015 and then the two uh, scenarios in 2050. Um, and what we see is that per capita emissions are much higher in sort of the wealthier parts of Europe, uh, again, central, northwest, west um, in 2015. Um, but we're actually going to see, again, within Europe, a, a sort of turning of tables uh, with much higher emissions in 2050 in Eastern Europe, uh, partly due to population growth, also due to increased economic development. Um, if we move on to the third bar, we can see that there are emissions cuts across the board. Um, and really what, what these high ambition policies does is it, it, uh, it evens out the, 
per capita emissions across the whole continent, um, sort of helping everybody sort of comply with a kind of consistent carbon budget. Um, so going back to our, our discussion yesterday on urban transport, um, we heard this perspective that um, that access to opportunities, which is kind of the primary purpose of the transport system, needs to come before uh, before we really talk about decarbonization, um, just as much as a, a horse comes before a carriage. Um, and so, but in addition to this central purpose of connectivity and access to resources, a better connected transport network is also inherently more resilient. Um, if, if one link of the network uh, collapses due to, let's say, a natural disaster, um, it's more likely to recover quickly if there are other travel options. So because of these two reasons, we provide uh, a, a several indicators about the, the level of connectivity that the transport network is providing in the two scenarios. So first, for example, we looked at the number of direct rail links um, and we see that already in the Northeast of Europe, there's, there are pretty ambitious plans to expand the network. But in our high ambition scenario, the, the sort of the bundle of policies uh, more than doubles uh, the expansion of the rail network in the rest of Eastern Europe. And so that could create some really positive benefits in terms of connectivity. Uh, we also calculated a quality of service index, which is pretty common in aviation. And we find that, well, it's already pretty high in Europe and it's actually only gonna go down um, in the future, but we found that actually the high ambition scenario actually uh, sort of slows down that deterioration, deterioration in quality of service, um, mainly by providing more rail options. So we also um, calculated the fuel index, which is a measure of the, the dispersion in prices across different non-urban modes. And we find that um, in this case, the high ambition scenario could actually exacerbate the dispersion in prices especially for um, interregional itineraries between Europe and the regions that are farthest away. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that um, uh, travelers from these faraway regions um, could experience some, some less attractive options with these uh, measures in place. So thanks. Um, so just to summarize our key insights here, um, in terms of activity and emissions, um, Europe is really not on track um, to meet emissions targets. And as we've emphasized several times, that is largely thanks to growth in demand for air travel. Um, but we can achieve at least Europe's uh, more moderate uh, targets um, to cut emissions um, using our, our high ambition measures. And so what we found is that the economic and the regulatory instruments um, are really what drive the early reductions sort of before 2030. Um, and then later on, we see the technology and rail infrastructure are going to bring much deeper cuts at a lower cost. Um, in terms of equity and connectivity, um, our, our measures even out the geographic distribution of emissions across Europe and also uh, in other world regions. So that's a really positive sign. Um, but we also recognize that travel to the distant, most, the furthest regions from Europe um, is going to be more expensive. And that's something we uh, need to be sort of straightforward about um, as we propose these policies. Uh, we also are gonna see fewer direct air links um, just as rail becomes more competitive and we, we internalize the price on flying a little bit. Um, but, uh, but rail will, will expand throughout Eastern Europe. Um, and finally, uh, we're gonna see an increase in multimodal trips that don't involve private cars. So, I mean, it might be more common for someone to take a shared ride to a high-speed rail and then maybe rent a shared electric bike for the last mile. Um, and so that could be a really interesting change to, to see um, in this more uh, highly high ambitious um, scenario. Um, so of course we welcome your feedback on how we define these scenarios, how we did the modeling um, and how I interpreted the results here. Um, but we're also curious to hear um, what you guys think about the feasibility of these scenarios and uh, the broader implications. Um, and so here are a couple of sort of example questions to just kind of stimulate the discussion. Um, how likely is this high ambition uh, scenario to materialize? And what do you think are the main barriers uh, to it happening? And what are the most significant side effects of these decarbonization measures and how could we mitigate them? Uh, for example, how can we ensure that the whole supply chain for sustainable aviation fuels is sustainable? 
And do you think the current trajectory of this sector will reduce or actually uh, exacerbate equity concerns? Um, which measures do you think can be implemented just on a local scale? And which ones do you think require international cooperation, maybe throughout the EU or even at a broader scale? Um, and finally, what potential threats do you think could derail these initiatives um, to decarbonize non-urban passenger transport? And what could we do to kind of future-proof future these measures um, going forward? So thanks a lot for your time and attention. Looking forward to a, a great discussion. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Dimitris. And thank you very much, Andreas, for these uh, fantastic uh, presentations. Uh, you stole the moderator's thunder there, Jonathan, by asking very pertinent uh, questions. And I hope that we will uh, um, uh, talk about uh, these issues indeed in a minute. But before we do so, um, I will uh, use my uh, executive powers as the moderator and ask uh, two questions about the presentation that we just heard uh, from our audience. Um, first one is on interregional travel. Um, can you, Jonathan, maybe um, clarify um, that map that you showed on one of the slides? Was it travel between EU regions and other world regions? That's it? That was one of the questions. So it's not between um, those regions that you had on the map and other non-EU uh, regions? Um, that's correct. Just to be very precise, um, so our definition of Europe does include some non-EU countries, but what I'm showing is travel between Europe and those other countries, yeah, and those other regions, sorry. Great, thanks. Um, and the second question is on um, our rail assumptions um, behind the model. So do the rail assumptions include the carbon cost of rail construction or, or analysis on the other uh, impacts such as noise and uh, um, if I can add to the question that was asked uh, by one of the participants, why are we not including these? Uh, so <laughs> the the answer is no, they do not include uh, the costs of uh, during the construction uh, of the railings and the reason for that is that these are, it is hard to allocate those throughout the lifespan of, uh, of a project, you need to do a proper life cycle analysis in order to understand how much uh, will be per uh, vehicle kilometer and so on. And it is not within, one could argue it is not within our mandates in the same way as we do not allocate emissions from road constructions to uh, road, uh, road, road users. All right, thank you very much. And thank you again uh, for your fantastic uh, presentations. We will now move um, uh, to part two uh, of uh, um, uh, the session um, this morning, um, the panel discussion. So uh, again, welcome Rolf, uh, Mark, Angelo and Monique. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, today um, for the panel um, discussion. And let me start um, with a question um, uh, to all of you. So we have heard um, more details behind the assumptions underpinning the current scenario and the high ambition scenario and their implications um, uh, on carbon emissions from air transport and uh, also uh, on emissions um, uh, on other transport modes um, uh, more broadly. The question is, what would have to happen for this high ambition scenario to become a reality? Because this is indeed uh, where we want to get. What do you think are the biggest challenges to the realization um, of this scenario? Um, and let me start uh, from Mark, if that's okay. Mark, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can uh, uh, hear me. Uh, good morning to everybody. I'm very pleased to participate to this panel and to, to try to answer your questions. We have a fan fantastic challenge ahead of us uh, for the whole industry, in particular for the transport industry. Uh, let me first say that aviation is totally committed uh, to the objective of fighting against climate change and reduce emissions and CO2 emissions of aviation. You know that uh, uh, since 28, um, we have taken globally, so worldwide, a commitment with the airlines, the manufacturers, the airports, and air navigation uh, uh, services to halve the emission globally of aviation in 2015. It was according to the Kyoto Protocol, but it's still valid with the Paris Agreement uh, because it's, it's, it's aligned with the objective between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees Celsius. 
And uh, there is a, uh, it was done through ATAG, and there is a very uh, recent and interesting study of ATAG uh, showing the robustness of this plan to have emission of aviation. But also, it shows, and, and this is for me the most important, that if you extend these efforts, uh, aviation can be globally, so worldwide, carbon neutral in 2060 without offsetting. And uh, I think it's a fantastic, uh, of course, challenge, but also. Uh, uh, information today is that we can achieve this, and as Airbus, we are totally convinced that this is feasible. There is another uh, ongoing study, Destination 2050, to show the feasibility of, of, of a zero uh, uh, or carbon neutral aviation by 2050 uh, in, in the framework uh, in Europe of the Green Deal. I think Andreas and, and Jonathan and uh, Dimitris have shown that. Uh, to achieve this goal, uh, we need um, a lot of actions uh, together states and industry and a mix of solutions. Uh, the first one is a, uh, a change in technologies. And of course, for this, we need a huge effort in R&T to switch to new technologies. Um, as of us, we have explored electrical aircraft and we don't believe this is a solution uh, because of the weight of batteries, uh, and we do believe that the most promising solution is hydrogen. And we just launched uh, a very large uh, research project uh, with three new concepts of zero emission aircraft to be uh, with the ambition of having this aircraft flying around 2035. Um, uh, three concepts. Uh, so uh, blended wing body aircraft, a very new concepts uh, like this. More classical turbo prop, uh, which means uh, an aircraft with a range of 1,000 1, vehicle miles and 100 passengers, uh, and a turbo fan, which is more classical with more than 2,000 uh, nautical miles and uh, 200 passengers. And so we think that uh, with this technology, we can achieve a really uh, a big step uh, towards net zero for aviation. And uh, hydrogen is not only. Uh, you can use a uh, hydrogen uh, burn in an engine. You can use hydrogen for produce electricity on board, fuel, fuel cells, and you can use uh, hydrogen also uh, to uh, produce uh, electrical fuel, P2L. Well. So we really need to, to think about that. Then, of course, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, our aircraft are already uh, certified for 50% uh, blended SAF. Uh, P2L is, is another uh, way of getting uh, SAF with a reduction of 80 to 90 percent of the CO2 emission for aviation. And this is certainly the solution for uh, sustainable aviation, especially long range aircraft. And, and we totally support the, the refuel project in Europe. And by the way, uh, the mandate is, uh, is much higher than the one you are proposing here in IETF in 2050. I think it's up to 60 or 65 percent. And um, we are working as Airbus to have a certification of aircraft in the future that should allow such a level of, of blended uh, uh, fuel with SAF. Carbon price, uh, you underline carbon price. Uh, we do not think that we need 500 uh, carbon price because uh, if you look at a uh, carbon, carbon capture and uh, electrical fuel, the, the cost will be more around 300. Uh, and so uh, I think. Uh, uh, with the EU ETS in Europe, which will go grow fast uh, due to the uh, very ambitious objective that should be confirmed soon of, uh, of EU. And of course, here worldwide, we have a, a carbon pricing that uh, is already in place and, and will be a very good in incentive to switch to uh, these new technologies and new fuels. ATM also, uh, there is a recent report in Europe that shows that uh, we can still improve ATM and reduce CO2 emission of aviation by 10%. I have to say now <laughs> that I don't really believe that the, the shift from aviation to ride, to ride is a solution. Uh, we do believe that they are different and complementary. Uh, as an example, the average uh, range uh, for travel by rail in, in Europe is 300 kilometers. It's 1,700 for a flight in, in, in Europe. Um, different mission. Uh, the connectivity is different. There is more than 8,000 
city pairs with a direct flight within Europe. So uh, air, air travels are providing much more connectivity. And if you look at the future, uh, to build a new uh, uh, fast uh, speed rail uh, infrastructure, uh, beside the, the, the cost and, and, and CO2 emission of building to it takes 15 to 16 years. And so uh, you are in 2035, and we are planning uh, carbon neutral aircraft uh, at this horizon. So uh, when you look to the future, you can see that a, a green aircraft, a zero emission aircraft, uh, which will have no impact on, on the land occupation, biodiversity, and so on. And that will be with no emission can be a very uh, uh, good solution. And so the, the global impact of demand uh, for us will, won't be that high as the one presented here. We think the appetite to fly is still very high because it's fast, it's safe. Um, and if we are able to achieve our objective, which is really to, to reduce the emission of aircraft, to use suitable aviation fuel, we think that. Uh, the public, the people will, will still like to travel by air. So we are reasonably op optimist about the high ambition objective. We support the high ambition objective. It's a big challenge uh, on technology, development of sustainable aviation, for, but we think this is achievable. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, very interesting projects uh, indeed happening at Airbus. And I would like to go back to this um, in a minute to talk to you about what kind of um, um, challenges there are um, in terms of rolling out um, these uh, initiatives and, and how governments uh, could help us uh, get there. But uh, let's stop here for a moment. I think you provided a perfect segue by giving us your thoughts on ship to rail um, for, for Monique to, to take the floor now and tell us um, about um, her take with her perspective working um, for shift uh, to, um, to rail on um, what are the biggest challenges um, to decarbonization uh, of air transport um, in, in Europe and what are the opportunities, uh, particularly on the rail front? Monique, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yagoda. Uh, first of all, thank you to the ITF for the impressive work that you have done with your uh, studies. And thank you for inviting uh, Shift to Rail to all your uh, stakeholder events. Um, as a short introduction, Shift to Rail is a European public-private partnership um, implementing the major European research and innovation program in the railway sector. Uh, among our private members, we have the EU rail manufacturing industry, we have infrastructure managers, uh, railway undertakings, uh, research centers, universities, SMEs. Um, uh, we started from 2015 and I think we are uh, well on track. Um, if I look at the description in your report, on the rail uh, requirements for the uh, current ambition and the high ambition scenario. I think you set uh, ambitious targets, which is good. Um, within Shift Rail, we have various innovation programs that could help to realize um, the targets you set uh, for the rail service improvements, for the speed increase in conventional rail, and also for the improvement of uh, frequencies. Uh, as an example, I could mention our work in uh, the introduction of digitalization and automation in the air tra uh, sorry the rail traffic management field for example uh, automated train operations and ERTMS introduction to uh, create more capacity on the line which will help to increase service availability and uh, which will help to increase speed um, we also have um, work ongoing on optimized design of the infrastructure, uh, switches and crosses, bridges, tunnels, improved inspection and repair methods. It will all lead to better uh, track infrastructure performance, to less degradation, lower costs, and uh, this will also help to improve uh, capacity. 
Um, rail is a green mode of transport, but we can even make it more greener. We have a uh, innovation program on rolling stock and we invest, for example, in lightweight materials, uh, lightweight doors, for example, that will help to reduce weight, to save energy and to uh, increase the service extension of the infrastructure. Um, and we also develop alternatives for diesel traction. So we have research ongoing on battery and hydrogen powered rolling stock on non-electrified railway lines. Um, I have to say that we are a research and innovation program. So at the moment, um, what I mentioned is applied research. And what we need in a future program is uh, large scale demonstration, uh, demonstration activities in a real operational environment to speed up the way towards uh, market deployment. Um, I noticed that in your report for the um, high ambition scenario, you introduce the ultra high speed rail, the maglev. And um, within Shift Rail, this year we started a um, one year project on Hyperloop, which is an example of uh, disruptive, innovative technology on advanced uh, maglev. Um, it is still basic research because Hyperloop is a concept and we look, for example, into the concept of operations, the safety cases, operational conditions, testing methodologies, um, but uh, we need to follow the way from uh, development of concept into large scale demonstrators in real operational environment. And this will require infrastructure investment, it will require a business case, uh, and it's still a research and innovation phase. Um, and regarding the, the maglev rail networks, uh, maglev technology is more mature than Hyperloop, but also here the business case needs to be found. And uh, you have questions that arise, for example, can we use the current infrastructure? Do we need to create a new infrastructure? Do we have the funds to create this new infrastructure? What about the energy consumption? So from a research and innovation point of view, it's very interesting, but it will need time um, for a migration plan and for proper deployment. So to summarize, I think it's very good that you set high ambition targets. Um, if you want to really have the maglev or the hyperloop as um, a measure to reach your high ambition targets, you need a strong political commitment, uh, politicians who can look beyond their election cycles, you need to have funds and you need to have a business case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monique. Uh, it is very interesting to see what is happening in the rail sector uh, at the moment. And also thank you for sending this very important message to our European member countries that are uh, attending um, the, the workshop uh, today. Uh, now, um, Angelo, uh, you have worked uh, on uh, um, uh, modeling and many of these issues that we've been discussing today. Uh, what is your take on uh, the main challenges to the realization of the high ambition scenario? What would have to happen for it to become reality? Over to you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, so I think this is uh, a scenario which is really, really ambitious. And, uh, uh, but unfortunately, it's also not enough uh, because we see that we cannot manage to, to reach the target, the, the, the target of reduction of CO2 emissions. And so this is uh, something that calls us to, to think that technology is not enough and probably we'll have to, there will be the need to, to, to change also our behavior in, in, in for some, for part of the trips. And uh, you have already included this, uh, um, assumption on, uh, uh, for example, reduction of long distance trips uh, uh, in the future years. And, uh, but going to the, um, 
to, what will have to happen for to to have this uh, this um, this scenario i think there are uh, very um, very challenging policies uh, mentioned there for example the shift uh, to um, to rail transport this is something that has been pursued since uh, many years by by the european commission this was planned already with the ambitious target also in the in the 2011 white paper, but the progress so far has not been enough. And, uh, and because uh, moving, say, trips to, to rail is, is not easy, you need to look at the spatial patterns. It's, it's something that works between intercities, but at the regional level is more difficult, also due to, to the dispersion, to the urban sprawl. And it's also expensive. This is something that we need to, to think uh, into, to take into consideration. And uh, all these investments for uh, um, high speed, hyperloop, maglev are uh, extremely ex expensive. Another difficulty that I see in this, in this um, policy is, in this uh, package of policies in the high ambition scenario is for carbon pricing, uh, again, this is something that has been uh, um, in the agenda for uh, for a long time and also here um, there has been a lot of difficulties in the implementation so all of this uh, requires a lot of uh, um, a lot of say commitment uh, from uh, and a strong political guide the new commission uh, started with the with the green deal so with with the high ambition now there is uh, the new um, um, the new strategy for transport. I, I, I don't want to to steal the the role for Rolf that will talk much better on these topics. So there is the commitment for uh, for uh, in this direction from the Commission, but this is string. It's, it's a it's a it's a tough task. But the last point that I would like to to say is also that this um, these policies have a, a high impact uh, on. Uh, on the, um, on the various actors, on the economy, on the travelers. And therefore, I, I think uh, the, the, this is a, a good opportunity for the use of modeling tools. So I liked a lot the work that was done by the colleagues in, uh, in uh, ITF. We've been working in a sort of a parallel project uh, because also funded by the commission by DigiMove and DG Research and Innovation, and we have developed a, a trimod model, which is a model that goes more in detail in, uh, in the spatial analysis at the European level. And I think it's important to, to use these tools to, to have a better understanding of the winner and the losers, because the, 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 the impacts are so large and the changes required are so large that we need to, to see what are the, the difference in the different uh, parts of Europe uh, for the different type of travelers, uh, for the different type of economies that we have uh, for urban areas and rural areas. And therefore, uh, uh, we can only, we, we need to continue to do, to use this, uh, these tools to refine the analysis. And the, the bigger is the challenge, the more is the, the need to, to, to try to, to understand what could be the impact. Thank you very much, Angelo. Indeed, we need uh, um, a lot of political will and technology, uh, perhaps <coughs> uh, enough. And, and that's, a, again, a perfect segue for all to take the floor and tell us more about uh, um, uh, the work that they have been doing um, uh, on this very topic uh, inside DG Move and on the um, EU approach uh, to solving this challenge. Rolf, over to you. Yes, good morning everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate, of course, the ITF for this work and for the conclusion of the project. As we heard yesterday from our uh, research and innovation colleagues, financed indeed by us. And if I may say also with heavy input from uh, the Department of Mobility and Transport of the Commission and colleagues there. So we're really very pleased to have it concluded uh, and see it uh, being presented today. Uh, the conclusion of the project and the event today couldn't have been more timely, of course. I mean, reference was already made yesterday by colleagues and today again to the Commission uh, strategy for smart, sustainable and resilient mobility up until 2050. And indeed, I think uh, this strategy includes a number of replies to the issues that have been uh, 
have been raised at uh, at EU uh, level. It is, I mean, if we think back in 2016, the Commission came forward with a communication for a low emission mobility strategy. So, with the help of the European Green Deal and everything that happened, Paris and so on, we developed this further now to a vision of, as it's called, an irreversible shift to zero emission mobility. And the idea here is really to make all transport modes more sustainable and making sustainable alternatives to traditional transport available widely and putting the relevant incentives in place. I will not go through the whole uh, strategy here today, but I think this is already a, a very important uh, statement and a piece of information as such, because pro providing such a vision with the milestones 2030, 2035, 2050, which the Commission has put forward, this is giving an orientation. This is giving clarity to investors, to policymakers at various levels, and to transport uh, stakeholders at large. And this is very important because it will inform the decisions which are needed. And those are, as we were, as we were hearing, very difficult decisions at times, very costly in, uh, decisions at times. So this, this idea of an irreversible shift with clear milestones and targets and combined with the Commission action plan to, to accompany this is, uh, is for, from our perspective, really uh, uh, necessary to achieve it. Uh, your event today is, of course, also very timely in the sense that, uh, in the context of the European Green Deal, just yesterday evening, the European Council, the heads of state and government in the European Union, have decided on the minus 55 uh, emission reduction goal for 2030. There were still doubts in some corners, so this is settled now. So this is setting really the overall framework. And from from my from our perspective, from my perspective, in a way, I. Despite all the difficulties and challenges that there are, I mean, we have passed a tipping point. I think nobody is really seriously any longer disputing that uh, the direction which needs to be uh, taken to uh, to make this happen. Of course, everything which was said about the need for a holistic approach, uh, about that there is no silver bullet solution, uh, as, as uh, the ITF report also very nicely uh, works out, very true. This is also why we have come up with an action plan which is detailing uh, horizontal measures, but also very detailed action plans per mode, which including, uh, I should say, uh, not shying away from touching the difficult issues. Of course, carbon pricing is difficult, but I mean, there is a clear uh, commitment of the Commission for full internalization of external cost in transport. Full internalization of external cost in transport. The Commission is in has uh, subscribed to this in the strategy and we will come forward with proposals notably on revising the, uh, the relevant taxation rules but also for reforming the emission trading system with the strong com uh, transport component uh, next year. Next year will of course for us be the year of delivery with a whole set of proposals on sustainable aviation fuels, sustainable fuels in maritime uh, CO2 emission standards and the ones I mentioned and I could go on for, for quite some time uh, 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 as well. Uh, one component I would perhaps also in terms of what are the challenges, what are the replies to these challenges, like to highlight is the financing. Uh, the Commission has come forward with uh, proposals and a whole uh, action plan on sustainable finance in general. And uh, uh, it, the uh, various uh, financing programs which are now being continued or which have been also yesterday evening in, uh, in, uh, in the next generation EU, the Resilience and Recovery Fund component be finally validated by the heads of state and government. So these massive financing programs will include earmarked, clearly earmarked elements for sustainability and also the digital trans uh, transition. And the digital transition is highly re relevant in transport, as we all know. And transport will, will clearly need to, uh, uh, to be a big, big share of, of those uh, programs and the implementation. You were also wondering about challenges, about your high uh, uh, ambition scenario. I think you mentioned some of these already, notably also the equity point. I mean, our first executive vice president, uh, Franz Timmermans, always mentions equity as first. And it's not a coincidence that among the 10 flagships that the uh, Commission has identified in its transport strategy, one is about, uh, what is it called? In, in, uh, one is, one is about uh, 
fair and uh, the fair transition and uh, taking into account all these equity concerns. Uh, again, here, I mean, this is a, a multifaceted issue. That's very clear. Uh, when we work out the various instruments which there are, I mean, I, I, I would say there are two dimensions. There's always the general European Green Deal dimension, and their financing will play a big role. And uh, I mean, as you, as, you, as you know, at a high political level, the Commission has also decided to set up a so called just transition funds to see to it that the uh, regions that are, but not only regions, but also social groups which are expected to lose out in this transition will receive compensation and that there will be tools and financing available at general level. I mean, this is, of course, a more broader issue, but transport is a big component in this. And then at a more concrete issue, when we talk about, for instance, pricing instruments, I, mean, I will not advance now uh, or anticipate what the Commission will work out in the impact assessments and the precise initiatives to come. But of course, you can, you can think about many things about in the pricing instruments, how to design uh, the incentive which is given to sustainable transport nodes, but also in those pricing elements include a social dimension and so on and so forth. So there are policy measures and levers that we can, that we can use. Uh, yesterday, in preparing this, uh, this conference, I was also once again uh, going through the measures and trends that you have identified, uh, or that you have collectively actually identified, comparing this a little bit with the measures that are now set out in the uh, Commission strategy. And I think there's a big over, <laughs> there's a big matching of areas, obviously, but also of concrete instruments. I mentioned, of course, uh, some of them already. In terms of uh, the concrete um, modeling assumptions, what we have done for the European Green Deal and now for the strategy was to base ourselves on the so-called climate transition uh, action plan, plan and the detailed modeling that was. Various scenarios are available. They all lead on the assumptions and on, on the more general assumption that our assumptions will be implemented. They will all lead to uh, achieving the net zero emission target at 2050. They will all lead to this, which is very important for us. For transport, we will look at 90%, and this is what this uh, 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 smart, sustainable, and resilient mobility strategy uh, commits to. Overall, it will be net zero. Now, with the 2030 objective and the milestones of the, of the, of the strategy, this will be further. Uh, rendered more stri stringent uh, in, the, in the more foreseeable future. Coming back to the more precise issues, uh, it's true that from our vision, what is in the high ambition strategy, uh, what is put there about technology, technological advances, notably on aviation. In our modeling, we were a bit more, uh, more uh, prudent, I should say. But then again, for instance, uh, for 2035, we have a milestone in the strategy of large zero emission aircraft ready for market. So, <clears throat> and this is also uh, at EU level very much supported by appropriate financing programs, not least in the area of research and development, uh, Horizon 2020, and so on and so forth, but also by accompanying regulatory measures. Uh, I mean, the sustainable aviation fuels was mentioned, of course, that will come next year, and that will set the appropriate incentives that will also make private investors uh, almost compel them to, to make the relevant choices. On fuel mandates, we are still in, in the finalizing phase of uh, aviation and maritime uh, aviation fuel uh, mandates. You go with the assumptions very high. The same is for carbon pricing. We will see with the reform of the emission trading system where we end up. For the time being, our thinking is indeed that uh, at least in the immediate future, we will not be able to probably go as high as 500 euro as, uh, as it's in your uh, uh, modeling work supporting the high ambition scenario. But this is not meaning to say that there is a fundamental uh, uh, discrepancy. To the contrary, as I said, we as DG Move, we contribute heavily to this. We are very happy to see this concluded and we see it as an extremely important contribution to the overall work. Thank you for now.
Thank you very much, Rolf, and thank you for giving us this uh, fantastic uh, overview of EU initiatives, and also a very updated one, because you told us about what happened uh, just yesterday, uh, so, so that's great. Um, all of you stress the importance of the political will in, in getting to the high ambition scenario. You mentioned to us um, different uh, initiatives by Airbus uh, in order to um, uh, deploy uh, technological advancements that will help us decarbonize. Aviation. I mean, where would we be with decarbonizing um, the air transport sector without technology? It would be really interesting to hear your take on how governments can help the industry get there. Yes, um, of course, uh, we need a, a joint action of the industry and, and the governments uh, to go in this direction. As I said, that for us, uh, the first objective is, is really to enhance the research um, to go to a more decarbonized technology. And so, of course, uh, the investment will be first uh, investment coming from the industry. And uh, as others, we, we are prepared to invest uh, in these new technologies, new generation of aircraft. Uh, of course, uh, uh, governments can help. Uh, we have two major uh, research programs in Europe that can help so the Clean Sky program. Uh, that we expect to be extended, which is supported the research in technologies and the CESAR program, uh, which is investing in improving the ATM. And I said ATM, traffic management can have uh, an important role in reducing CO2 emission of aviation by being more efficient. Uh, as we are looking for uh, hydrogen as a new source of energy for aircraft, uh, it's interesting also uh, to see that there are initiatives in Europe, in the world, to, to develop hydrogen. And uh, of course, uh, it will need a huge effort of the industry, but also the, the states to incentivize and, uh, and, and, and support the development of hydrogen as uh, any other sources of green energy. Because we have, Andreas has demonstrated very well, and the first uh, issue is to develop green energy. Uh, and this is really a responsibility, I think, uh, of the state first to develop the capabilities of uh, uh, greener with less uh, carbon impact uh, energies. So we do hope that this will uh, happen. And uh, then, of course, we have seen that uh, states, uh, governments can also have a role uh, to play in the development of other solutions and sustainable aviation fuels for, for aviation. We, we, we spoke of mandates and so on. Of course, uh, we have to be aware that aviation has uh, suffered very much of the COVID crisis. And so the first objective uh, for, for the governments today should, should be to help this sector to recover. To, to find and to have the capacity of investing in the next steps, which is a greener aviation. So we, we do count also on the governments at EU level, at state level, at ICAO level, to look at this situation and uh, take, take into account the situation today coming from the COVID crisis and adapt the solution for the future so that it's something feasible, but also variable that uh, the industry can support. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, and Monique, I wanted to uh, go back to the topic of shift to rail. Uh, you gave us um, many great examples of how the rail sector is um, becoming greener and also how it's becoming more efficient and can provide better quality uh, of service to the passengers. And of course, these uh, elements are um, all very um, important. But in our uh, DTEU report, we also talk about a very cross-modal perspective on decarbonizing. And I wanted to um, uh, ask you um, about uh, multimodal hubs uh, for rail and aviation. Uh, what do you think about them? Uh, will they facilitate the shift to rail? Uh, some um, uh, uh, voices out there say, well, if you have multimodal hubs, it will just mean we'll have uh, more planes and, and not uh, more trains. Uh, what's your take on that? Um, well, I think that uh, multimodal hubs can incentivize uh, this switch between um, uh, rail and air or to help uh, increase the complementarity between rail and air. Uh, multimodal hubs uh, 
can give access to various transportation modes. And uh, within Shift Rail, we uh, support the development of a mobility as a service platform uh, so that it's easier for travelers to choose their preferred mode of traveling. And uh, with the smart application we develop within our program on IT services for passengers, uh, we develop, for example, a multimodal travel companion, and this gives a traveler access to all multimodal travel services, for example, shopping, shopping or ticketing, tracking, planning after sales. Um, we also work on a technology demonstrator uh, that has the aim to provide a one-stop shop for booking, payment and ticketing for different transport modes, including air. Um, and uh, with these kind of smart applications and with the multimodal hubs, we think this uh, will make it easier for uh, travelers to uh, book. Um, their combined tickets and to uh, choose their journey, uh, not only the long distance traveling by uh, air, but also a shorter distance complementarity by rail, and then including the first and the last mile with, for example, uh, shared mode services in urban environments. Um, and uh, for example, if you think in the Netherlands about Schiphol Airport, which you consider as a, a multimodal hub, there you see see that you have this uh, combined tickets of long distance traveling by air and then at Schiphol Airport you take the Thales train and you travel further to Brussels, um, Paris uh, and at the moment also there is a link to, uh, to London. So um, uh, I'm positive about it. Thank you Monique. Now, Angelo, I wanted to go back to um, uh, what you said about uh, different assumptions underpinning the DTEU scenarios. So we talked about um, the importance of the technology, the importance of policy and uh, how we need political will in order to um, um, bring change um, uh, over the next uh, few years when it comes to decarbonizing the sector. But what we haven't talked about yet is uh, is actually um, us so uh, citizens and, and residents uh, of of europe um, one of the uh, assumptions underpinning the high ambition scenario is that um, up to um, 30 percent um, fewer flights will happen by 2050 as a result of um, passengers thinking that aviation is uh, perhaps uh, environmentally unfriendly so the flight shaming movement in other words will take off and people will decide to travel more locally. Um, presumably this is also induced by increased uh, teleworking and, and so on. Do you think that's a realistic scenario? What are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, no, I think this is something that mm, will materialize. I think it's a realistic scenario. Uh, we need to take into consideration that the um, environmental concern is uh, the main concern for the young generation and the, the young people, the, the Fridays for Future, these this young people will, will grow and will travel in the, in the, next, uh, in the next years. And uh, I think that there, uh, there is, a, it's, uh, it's credible to have uh, this, uh, this uh, concern. But I think this will also be complemented by uh, the impact, uh, the, I, I think the inertia that will uh, remain after this COVID experience, after this uh, big disruption that we are having. Uh, people, I think, are starting to reconsider what would, could be uh, the final destination for uh, holidays. There will be health concern in traveling in, uh, in um, airplanes. And uh, and uh, uh, this, I think, can, uh, can be realistic. And uh, of course, there, is a, there are other aspects that contribute, again, uh, the, what we have been discussing, the competition for, uh, from rail. And uh, for example, now there is the renaissance of uh, night trains rail in Europe. Uh, so they are opening new lines. There will be 
the opening of new lines next year. And this is again a, another option, uh, uh, avoiding traveling by, by air. And the last element is what about if uh, uh, air traveling uh, is, becomes more expensive as it used to be 20 years ago? Uh, what happens if the um, low cost uh, market, low cost airlines market will not uh, restart uh, in the same condition that it was one year ago? And uh, this, of course, this is a bit different from, uh, from the, the environmental concern of, of your uh, assumption. But I think that there is, a, um, there is also this factor that should be taken in, into, into consideration. A higher cost means that a lot of, uh, say, trips between cities from point to point uh, for a short weekend uh, or uh, this might not become more uh, feasible, uh, feasible anymore. And, th and therefore, I, I think that th these are elements that should be taken into consideration in, uh, in our uh, ambition scenario. Great, thank you, Angela. We, we all at the end of the day respond to incentives, don't we? Um, I wanted to uh, open actually this question up to our other um, panelists. Um, would you like to um, uh, tell us more about what you think about uh, um, the, the future of travel in that respect? Will, pa will passengers change their preferences? And I think we have avoided uh, talking about COVID to a large extent, but perhaps uh, a, a side question to that is, has COVID changed things? Do we think differently about the way we travel and work right now? And will that stay in the future if we're thinking into the long-term future, 2030, 2050? Mark, I can see you unmuted yourself. Uh, so uh, that means the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. As I said, COVID has a huge impact on the global economy and especially on air transport. But when we can see uh, that when there are flights, there are people on board, which means the appetite to fly uh, didn't really decrease. Uh, of course, at the very beginning, people have been very cautious about traveling. Um, now we can see that the restrictions at the borders and the quarantine have a reason for, for a low air traffic. But then when there, there is an offer, uh, people still like to travel. So probably there will be uh, an impact on, on longer term um, the attack report is, is estimating it. Uh, everybody is trying to estimate it, but it's not the range of what you, you can see in your, in your high level scenario. We understand this is a mix of different things, um, but we do believe that um, the appetite to fly will remain. Uh, perhaps it, it will be less than, than previously, but the, you know, the growth of air traffic was amazing. And what is very interesting is as soon as somebody can fly, he flies. And the, 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 the boost of the traffic in the emerging countries will be amazing. Because the first thing, when you have uh, the capability to, to, to buy a ticket is to discover the world and to see other culture and so on. So we do believe that this will remain. Of course, on short range, uh, we have to demonstrate our capability to, 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 to be um, as, as green as the other mode of transport. The, the existing performance is also amazing. You know, uh, a modern aircraft, it's two liters per passenger for 100 kilometers, so already much better than a car. And, and a few people know that, by the way. And so we also have to convince them that it's, it's, it's pleasant, it's fast, but uh, it's also part uh, of, of a friendly environmental transport. And this is our, our duty is to show that, but we are convinced that if we put this together, um, people will continue to travel in the future. Uh, but of course, the challenge is to make it uh, totally green and, uh, and less emission and so on. It's a challenge, but I think that the willingness is still there. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mark, I can see what you yourself as well. We are drawing to uh, the close of this panel. So the last word will go to DG Move, Rolf, over to you. Yes, uh, yeah, with pleasure. Uh, thanks for giving me the floor. Uh, of course, I mean, the, there are two dimensions here, I would say. I mean, there's the, in the, indeed the impact of the COVID crisis, and we don't know yet how this will work out. First indications seem to be that in the urban context, there might be changes in travel patterns. 
In the non-urban context, which, which is our main subject here, uh, it remains to be seen. When it comes to business travel, I think the experience is made now with, uh, with, with this, uh, events like the one we are currently all participating in. Will be will give will have a lasting effect, and so we will we will see a reduction on business travel in particular. For the rest, uh, on a personal level, I mean, there are surveys showing that uh, I mean we, we all make constantly reference to the Friday for Future uh, uh, movement, and there are surveys showing that it's not representative, at least in many countries, it's not really representative for young people. I mean. There also, you tend to see, I mean, that's what those surveys, I'm not giving a judgment what those surveys show. Uh, it's usually uh, people uh, which are coming from socially uh, adv advantaged uh, backgrounds. So I think this issue is also connected to the issue of equity that was, uh, that was uh, mentioned and highlighted a lot before. On balance, but we don't know yet, <laughs> and more research will need to be done. On balance, personally speaking, I would also believe that once COVID is overcome, there will be, of course, lasting effects in certain areas, urban, business travel, and so on and so forth. But the issues of connectivity and re related to this, the social dimension, also regional dimension, will remain high on the agenda. And uh, it would be, personally speaking, uh, on those grounds, be uh, prudent to assume that we will have a massive reduction of uh, travel uh, demand in future. Thank you, Rolf. Indeed, the question of equity is um, a very pertinent one. And unfortunately, we won't have the time to deal with none of the um, uh, questions uh, in our chat was uh, from Ayata about uh, um, key concern being the rise in ticket prices and the impact potentially of that on equity. But we'll have to unfortunately leave that um, for um, another time. I wanted to thank my colleagues for uh, answering all the questions um, uh, to, uh, um, uh, uh, in our Q&A chat uh, behind the scenes. So thank you very much for that. Uh, unfortunately, we did indeed run out of time. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, the presenters, uh, Andreas, uh, Dimitris and Jonathan, um, for sharing on their views. And thank you so much uh, to our fantastic panel um, today. Uh, Rolf, Mark, Angelo, Monique, uh, thank you um, uh, for joining us uh, today. Uh, we will keep you posted um, on uh, further uh, developments uh, and wrapping up uh, of this project. And with that, I would like to give the floor back to Dimitris, who will now tell us more about what will happen next. Uh, thank you, Jagoda, and thank you everyone who participated in the session. Uh, I wish we had more time. Uh, unfortunately, well, we have now a minute break, and we will then resume with the non-urban freight sector. So, thank you once again, and see you in uh, at eleven. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we will now move on with the final session of this event, the final thematic session, which will focus on non-urban freight, results, feasibility, and policy implications. Uh, I would like to remind to our participants to keep their microphones muted if they do not have the floor, and for the attendees to ask their questions using the Q&A function uh, at, their, uh, at their Zoom options. Also keep an eye on the chat as relevant publications will be uh, will be given and relevant links and publications will be given throughout the session. And now passing the floor on to our moderator, Olaf Merck from the ITF. Yes, many thanks and uh, good morning to, uh, to all of you. Uh, indeed, we're now at the uh, session on decarbonizing non-urban freight. And we have uh, two interesting speakers to uh, introduce uh, this uh, theme. We have four uh, great panelists, and in total we have one hour and three quarters uh, of an hour, uh, which seems long, but uh, as we will see, uh, is actually pretty short for all the ground we have to cover in this session. So um, I'd like to, uh, to, to start immediately uh, with the first presentation, uh, which is uh, a presentation by uh, Professor Lori Tavassi from uh, the TU uh, Technical University of, uh, of Delft in the Netherlands, who, uh, who will speak, of course, on this theme. The floor is yours, uh, Professor. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Olaf, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my task is to introduce to you uh, the topic of decarbonizing non-urban freight transport in Europe. And um, the message of my talk is uh, the roadmap uh, to get from A to B to achieve our targets. Um, so uh, I will give a general overview of the field, discuss the framework for decarbonization of, of freight transport measures, and uh, I'll be focusing on non-urban, but of course urban is uh, also intimately related to non-urban flows. I'll discuss single measures to decarbonize and also discuss some complexities to come towards a real roadmap. And uh, finally, I'll uh, reflect briefly on the ITF report results as an introduction to the presentation of uh, the uh, results themselves. So, um, as you might know, uh, there is a book out by Ellen McKinnon on decarbonizing logistics, uh, which sketches five routes to deep decarbonization. These have been adopted also by ELIS, the uh, European Technology Platform for Logistics, and uh, has recently produced a, a setup for a roadmap on zero emission logistics. So these five routes are um, one by one, the different columns you see here, reducing freight transport demand itself, optimizing the modes, so a shifting from road transport to rail and waterways, and optimizing these shifts in a dynamic way. Third is to increase asset utilization to uh, make sure that uh, the trucks and the vessels and the trains we use today are uh, the capacity is used uh, as well as possible. There's still 20% of empty trips today and uh, the average loading varies between 40 and 60%. Improving fleet energy efficiency uh, takes it uh, towards the uh, hardware used uh, and the software used uh, by uh, the different means of transport, uh, including the driver, uh, to make sure that we uh, operate efficiently. And finally, uh, which lies beyond the bounds of the transport sector alone, reducing the carbon content of the energy used. It has important consequences for propulsion systems also in the vehicles and so on. Uh, but uh, the broader background is one of energy transition. So the question uh, I think we have to ask here is not just how e all these individual, what their impacts are, but how they will combine to achieve our target of uh, what we in the Netherlands call the factor six or 83% of uh, increase of carbon efficiency. Uh, so uh, we can imagine scenarios of these uh, being combined. Um, uh, the question is, uh, well, how do they combine and what are the complexities of combining them? Together, that should lead to a roadmap, which allows us also to flexibly shift between the routes that are available. So the latest output in this area uh, from the European circles is uh, the uh, LS uh, roadmap towards, or a framework to move towards a roadmap, I must say, for zero emission logistics. Um, Ellis has uh, listed and compared different uh, measures, individual measures, as you see in the matrix here. And the horizontal axis in the matrix uh, shows the feasibility or the time to deployment uh, before measures can really successfully start to work. And the vertical axis uh, are uh, the rows show the estimated impact of, for greenhouse gas reduction. So from low at the bottom to very high on the top. Um, of course, we all would want uh, short term measures that uh, work uh, with a very high impact, uh, but these are rare and they're quite difficult to introduce. And especially uh, for uh, well, urban freight, they're easier like electrification than for non-urban freight. On the very long term, we're looking at new energy systems uh, for, for nuclear energy or based on wind and solar, so renewable sources. Um, and on the short term, uh, we have a whole array of efficiency measures that can still work. Uh, these are strategically important because uh, compared to or uh, onto the route to, uh, towards 2050, they will have a relatively long time uh, to reduce the carbon emissions. So uh, we have to uh, introduce these as soon as possible. And on the medium term, there are measures like model shift, also demand reduction, uh, 3D printing, for example, and consolidation of loads, uh, which take a bit more time to be deployed and have also a little bit more impact. So uh, understanding this range of measures is important and also how to deploy them one by one. 
But of course, this comes with some complexities and I'll discuss a couple of them here. Um, there is uh, basically the, I think the biggest, uh, most important realization we have to have here is that there's no silver bullet. Not one of these measures individually will help us to get to achieve our targets. Um, there's an important discussion uh, that is emerging now in the literature uh, about degrowth, as they call it, uh, whether this would be necessary or not uh, to achieve the target. So basically, uh, they're questioning whether the left column reducing freight transport demand is critical for success or not. Of course, uh, we have to ask whether it's realistic. Also, there are many uncertainties around 3D printing, and we don't know how dematerialization with consumers will de develop. At least there are very few incentives for this, as we're seeing that consumer behavior is evolving in a completely different direction, creating more freight and more shipments, not less. So for the debate on the future on decarbonization, this is an important topic. Now, uh, in terms of uh, mode choice, there are massive sh shifts being projected and also seen as feasible. Um, and there's, uh, well, there's a debate about whether uh, this can be done at all uh, at such a high, uh, even at such a high price of $500 uh, dollars per ton CO2. Then about uh, increasing asset utilization and improving, improving fleet energy efficiency, there are clearly short-term opportunities here. Uh, we've seen the platforms emerge, the uh, market, the freight markets, uh, but at the same time, the costs of trucking will fall uh, very strongly, uh, 40 to 50 percent, also as uh, depicted in the scenarios of ITF. On the long term, uh, we expect uh, some effect of the physical internet, uh, 15 to 20 percent uh, improvement in uh, utilization. Uh, so these are not very high improvements uh, and they're also enormous forces against uh, because the costs of trucking will drop. Finally, the energy transition. Uh, here we have for the long term both uh, options for IC, for internal combustion engines and for electric vehicles where uh, the uncertainty seems to be about the source of energy and the carrying and the storage of energy, what kind of options we use there. And these options are not clear yet. Uh, and of course, uh, they're not clear because the energy transition is a larger problem than uh, just the uh, transportation sector alone. So uh, from the perspective of transportation, we also see that uh, for non urban freight, there are many different segments. I will say a little bit more about this later on. And each of these segments requires a separate approach, has separate mechanisms, separate effects. And uh, we need to know uh, how this will play out before we can devise a good strategy. Of course, for governments, it's not an easy time to live in either. So industry is uh, requiring a stable government. I see, I lost my presentation here. Is uh, requiring a stable government and is reliable, which sort of takes away the risks involved uh, in, in climate adaptation and climate mitigation. But of course, uh, this is impossible for government to do completely. So. The adaptivity that is needed here uh, comes with uh, huge challenges, uh, also for government and also for the market that are not easy to solve. This is a, a very uh, wicked problem. Then, uh, as uh, I think a, an important word when talking about equity here is about the common issues of uh, economies that are emerging or poorer or developing. Uh, we just had our conference uh, with the Center for Sustainable Road Freight on uh, the, the focus focal point of uh, developing countries and emerging countries and um, it was interesting to see that there there's a relatively big step that can be made in terms of efficiency gains more so than in the rich countries also there's a real risk that these countries will become a dumping ground for ICEs as we're already seeing now within Europe uh, for diesel vehicles and finally uh, the uh, emphasis in policies is slightly different where there's much more emphasis on infrastructure policies. And um, I think we should also try to mainstream uh, climate mitigation better into the infrastructure funds and infrastructure programs that are being built for these countries. So these provide three interesting avenues for development. Concerning all the freight modes, there are a few scenarios uh, here uh, that uh, I think where the ITF also adds to, uh, which is very good. Um, and uh, they show that uh, many different measures will have to be deployed next to each other for uh, non-urban freight. So uh, next to uh, light density vehicles, there will also be emphasis on marine and aviation improvements. 
um, with low carbon fuels and so on. So this uh, package of uh, vehicle improvements, compliance improvements, efficiency improvements uh, will have to add up to the necessary reduction. And there are few studies where this addition is made, uh, how it should be composed and what is realistic to achieve uh, the targets uh, met, uh, that we have to meet. Concerning uh, model shift, um, I think the, the, there's huge differences uh, between the OECD countries in terms of the development of different modes. So uh, for road transport, we've seen a surge in China in the past 15 years. Um, well, rail and waterways are only recently have become, um, are uh, reducing in, uh, in the, uh, terms of their performance. So um, how to counter this development? Uh, in, in Europe, we have seen fairly continuous uh, development, or at least a flat line almost, uh, of the different modes of transport. So if we want to change this uh, significantly, then uh, where will this change come from? And uh, why do we expect that this could be done uh, radically within Europe? I think those assumptions will have to be made explicit and uh, also made tangible and, and validated in terms of the uh, laws of the market. And I've seen no study that does this uh, until now. In terms of road freight transport, which will still have the majority of the flows, there are a couple of more studies that are available here. And um, also these speak of a range of measures where uh, energy efficiency is an important one. So better loading and reduced demand, interestingly, have only a marginal impact. Biofuels, strong impact, and also electrification, of course, eventually over the long term will become very important. Uh, but we'll only be uh, working at a later stage, so after 2030, from a well-to-wheel perspective. Uh, so energy efficiency is not just uh, improved driving behavior, but also logistics measures. Uh, to improve coordination between modes. I think uh, an important discussion here is also, as we've seen in the latest reports of the uh, Sustainable Road Trade Center, is uh, the uh, necessary uh, electricity demand to decarbonize uh, road freight. Uh, so the, the e-fuels and hydrogen require much more energy, and this will have an impact on the energy price or on the, uh, the need, uh, on the capacity of industry to create this energy. Um, this is uh, largely being ignored so far. So I think this should be included also in the predictions much better. And on the basis of this, the, the uh, English report, UK report comes with a recommendation to use the catenary system uh, for uh, electric vehicles, for the long distance at least. So looking at different segments uh, reveals also interesting properties of the system. Uh, this is a result of a Dutch study. On the left, we see uh, two segments, bulk goods and consumer goods for a long distance freight. And um, what we see is that the type of measures that will have the required impact differ completely. So for bulk goods, there's relatively little scope in reorganizing the logistics and redesigning the vehicles and much depends on electrification and alternative fuels. For consumer goods, it's exactly the opposite. So the largest effect will come from better organization of transport. So when we compare these, these mixes, it means we have to have different strategies for different segments in the freight sector. A single strategy will also have different impacts per segment. So what is the smart mix strategy here that needs to be deployed? Um, maybe we can go for both simultaneously, but certainly uh, they cannot be uh, they cannot have the same impacts in all the segments. So understanding at the deeper level what's happening within these sectors, I think is very important. And we're only at the beginning of this insight. A word about air cargo and shipping. Well, uh, we have seen that uh, market crisis uh, like the one this year, but also earlier ones have improved the efficiency and have had uh, quite strong impacts on how the operations are being run. But some of this is reversible. So slow steaming is a famous example for uh, maritime transport where this has had an enormous impact on the energy use of, uh, of ships. Um, as long as the engines are not built in a way that this is the optimal uh, speed uh, for ships, this is still reversible. So for reasons of capacity management, uh, ships can also speed up if needed. 
So it, as this is an international system with uh, special governance challenges, it's, different, it's difficult to make a difference here and to uh, make new transitions. But in recent years, we have seen an increasing willingness and also planning uh, to uh, develop here. And there are two uh, major opportunities I want to highlight here. First is the fleet management and logistics incentives, which um, improve efficiency still. There's still uh, quite uh, some potential left. And also uh, the, the speed and the, uh, the whole concept of shipping, the, the chain organization, I think is uh, very important here where we can still optimize. So this depends a lot on digitalization uh, of the shipping uh, sector and of the uh, entire supply chain. So some reflections on the ITF report, uh, finally. Uh, so I think overall, if I read it, I see a very positive message, which, which says that significant reductions uh, seem feasible here. And, and I think that's very important to understand that uh, when the right measures are deployed, uh, we can achieve the targets. And that's a, a good starting point to have discussions. It's an integrative and a quantified scenario, which also sets it apart from much of the work done so far. It uses uh, well-known models, accepted models, and um, it uh, comes to a final, uh, final call also. So questions I have about the report is uh, whether the, the tank-to-wheel successes, which is the focus of this study, will also build up to well-to-wheel impacts. So uh, if we want to uh, achieve uh, zero carbon systems, then we need the energy sources also to be zero carbon. Uh, so uh, what would be the view on this? Second, the, the scenario in which these targets are achieved is the high ambition scenario. And, and I think there's also uh, the success here is largely due to, or partly due to external factors that lie beyond the scope of the policymakers and uh, like dematerialization, for example, or 3D printing. Uh, so uh, in that sense, it uh, can be interpreted in two ways, like uh, we are organizing our problems away from the transport sector, or we are scoping where we need to take responsibility ourselves, uh, to what extent this is feasible uh, to achieve the targets from the transport sector itself. So it's interesting to go a bit more deeply perhaps into this in the discussion. Then um, I have questions about the, the uh, market proofing of uh, the validity of certain abatement measures. So. The price here considered is quite steep, of $500 per ton, and it's it's in the line of abatement measures that, that would need to be taken uh, to achieve this level of reductions. But then there are also internal um, uh, um, assumptions being made in the models concerning, for example, uh, alternative specific constants in the model shift uh, model. And uh, whether these are consistent, I think it's... It, that would determine uh, the actual feasibility of this scenario internally in the transport market. Uh, there was a question about equity, and I think, uh, and I don't know the compensation scheme that uh, uh, was presented earlier or was, uh, was uh, mentioned earlier, but that would need to be the normative framework to see what kind of impacts we need to map and how and how to interpret these. So then depending on what this objective is, uh, what the objectives are and what the compensation schemes are, we will need to map it in different ways. Then uh, there was also a question uh, to me about resilience impacts of this scenario. So uh, would we expect uh, Europe and the European urban, non-urban freight transport system to become more resilient or less? And, and there are, four factors here at work, I think, which, uh, in which the balance is also uncertain, um, but there will be significant changes uh, as projected in these scenarios. So firstly, we'll see a change in scale of operations uh, if uh, all those uh, fragmented parcels are treated together in larger, uh, larger scale trucks and larger scale uh, trains, then uh, this makes the system less resilient. On the other hand, and uh, as, as e-commerce is driving towards uh, uh, this, uh, fragmented uh, shipment systems and the uh, future system of the physical internet allows these to exist uh, also in a, in a way that <clears throat> they are combined whenever possible, this uh, would make the system more resilient. The <clears throat> one of our big uh, topics, secondly, here is uh, reducing the slack capacity, so filling the trucks up more. 
uh, whenever something would happen to that truck, then the, the effect would be bigger because there are more shipments inside. Also, whenever we would need slack capacity for one reason or the other, it would not be available. So this would make the system less resilient. Third, uh, we will see changes in, in fleet size as, uh, of course, uh, we will have more loads in trucks. We will need fewer trucks, for example. So when fleets are smaller, then uh, we will need less hardware to change whenever a, uh, some adoption is needed of the fleet, for example, of engines. On the other hand, we will also have fewer trucks left uh, to respond if uh, uh, there is an infrastructure problem, for example, or if uh, there is a, a problem with regulation. So this could have positive and negative effects on resilience. But uh, for the longer term, I think for uh, sustainability, for decarbonization, it's better to use fewer trucks because then we need uh, smaller fleets to be changed, uh, for example, in terms of the new engines that are needed. Fourth, uh, there's also uh, the uh, new system of interconnected modes uh, through terminals, uh, through hubs, which uh, by definition is, is more resilient than the disconnected systems. So uh, if synchromodality becomes reality, then uh, this combined network will be more resilient than what we have now, uh, which is uh, at least dynamically separated. So all in all, I think uh, the balance of this is uncertain, uh, but there are uh, big changes, uh, radical changes that point towards negative and positive effects. And I think we would really need a further study to say something about the end balance. So summarizing, um, I, I think we are, uh, situating this study in a context of, of major growth, uh, uh, where the growth is not really questioned, and a major technological and governance challenges. Uh, so to achieve the level of change that we want, uh, we don't have the technology uh, only on design, and we don't have the governance uh, systems in place. Uh, there's only a handful of studies. Uh, so I'm talking about the, the, the information we have, the knowledge we have for policymaking, uh, and they provide mostly partial views uh, or all partial views and different strategies. So there's no consensus in which way to go here. There is a, a, a sense of positivity about that we can achieve the targets. And uh, this is built up roughly in, in short-term, medium-term, longer-term views, where the short-term says there's a critical influence of efficiency change. So uh, we must make all the minor changes possible as soon as possible in order to book a bigger impact over a longer period of time. And uh, on the short term also, uh, the biofuels could make a difference. On the longer term, we have various green energy and technology options open. So in different uh, kinds of uh, so energy sources, uh, storage, uh, carrying capacity, uh, you name it. There's, uh, I think, from e-fuels to hydrogen uh, and, and to catenary systems, we have options for trucks, we have options for for train and for uh, also longer distances. Um, and these are largely uncertain. They need to be viewed in a system perspective. <clears throat> in between these two, <clears throat> there's a kind of value of death. So <clears throat> we have the logistics reorganization that can take place, but also <clears throat> has been proved to be very difficult to realize significant impacts of uh, carbon reduction. And the fuels would need to move to second generation biofuels or move on towards e-fuels, uh, which is also something for past 2030, 2035. So I think we need to uh, try to pull these, uh, this knowledge together and, uh, and strengthen our efforts to uh, build an, a knowledge base uh, on which policy decisions uh, can be made in an informed matter, manner about which measures to deploy when and uh, which mechanisms we assume will be working. Um, the time window to do this is narrowing because we will need to make decisions very soon about fundamental changes. So this uh, shows the urgency, I think, of, of moving a more, in a more targeted way towards a roadmap. And the ITF study contributes to this movement. I think it's a positive, a quantified, integrative scenario, of course, with questions, but I think this is the direction that we need to move in. So with this, I want to conclude and thank you so much for your attention. Yes, many thanks, uh, Laurie, for this uh, very rich presentation with a lot of different uh, 
issues that we could discuss. We, I suppose we could discuss days about all this, but we have uh, limited time. You mentioned, of course, already your uh, perspective on the ITF work that uh, has just been released, and that gives us the opportunity to um, give the floor immediately to um, Francisco Furtado, who is a modeler at the, uh, the ITF, who uh, has been uh, essential for bringing this work forward and has led the work on the scenarios on mon open trade. I give you the floor, uh, Francisco. Thank you very much, Olaf, and thank you, Laurie, for the previous presentation. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll jump right into it uh, very briefly. Uh, the, um, the scenarios and the results, uh, the scenarios we tested and the results we obtained from the ITF modeling framework uh, have a very wide scope. Uh, they portray to all global freight activity and uh, in this uh, specific report, in this chapter, for non-urban freight and all domestic and international activity with five main modes, air, sea, road, rail, inland waterways, and of course the options for inter intermodal connections and actually many of the international uh, transport is actually intermodal because it always has a sea component and then a land component, at least a big part of it, at least. Uh, my colleagues in the previous sessions already went through this. Uh, there's basically two scenarios. Uh, one with the current ambitions, the stated ambitions uh, by, by policymakers, by, by governments. And then a high ambition scenario uh, where the measures are pushed further. The parameters of these measures are pushed further and they are implemented in a more ambitious uh, way. At least that's what happens in most of the cases. There's also some measures not present in one scenario, in one scenario and then present in others. Now, and as Lori was saying, there's saying there's no silver, silver bullet. So in our scenarios, we, we, we test these measures all, all together and the, and the interactions they have with each other, the impacts they have in different uh, sectors and in different areas. Uh, and in total for this report, there were 17 measures and trends or exogenous factors that were, uh, that were tested. I, here you can see the table with them. I won't go and list them all, but I'll give an example of, of each type of measures that uh, that we implementing, that we tested, knowing that in total there's at least uh, there's 17 of them. So, for instance, in terms of economic instruments, we already discussed carbon taxes in other sessions. So I chose here distance charges and um, distance based charges for road freight in specific, and they are applied in both scenarios. But in the current ambition, um, and both at the, the same starting year of 2030, but in the high ambition, they are start with a higher value. And by 2050, which is the horizon that uh, until when we tested, uh, it's more than double the value than in the current ambition. Uh, in terms of enhancement of infrastructure, for instance, we have rail and inland waterway improvements. We also have the TNT projects that are introduced in the, um, in the model. And in this case of rail and inland waterways improvements, actually this goes a bit even beyond enhancement of infrastructure because this has to do with the perception and attractiveness that with which these modes are looked upon by the market. And also with the penalties that we attribute in the model to multimodal connections. So for instance, in the current ambitions, uh, the attractiveness of these modes increases from um, 2% to by 2% to 20% uh, up to 2050. And the penalty of the, the penalties in intermodal connections also decrease uh, between 2% and 20%. And in the high ambition, this doubles. Uh, in terms of operations, uh, we one of the measures is asset sharing. 
uh, which uh, was briefly alluded here before. But in terms of well, at least its effects, uh, and asset sharing implies the sharing of, for instance, ve vehicles and warehouses between different uh, companies, different shippers, which leads to uh, more efficient use of resources, higher average loads, and this is exactly how it's modeled uh, or introduced in the model. It's an increase in the average loads of, uh, especially of uh, road freight, and again with higher values in high ambition and lower values and lower increases in current ambition um, then a regular a regulatory instrument that we have is the incentives for low emission uh, vehicles and fuels uh, and again um, and this is also associated had to be associated to with the investments in the distribution and uh, supply infrastructure. And uh, here we assume, for instance, in current ambition that the, this, uh, this will be present, the fleets with these uh, low emission uh, fuels, the commercial fleets would be, 10% of them would be with these vehicles in current ambition, while in high ambition, it would be 20%. And of course, this differs. Uh, in different regions of the world. So I'm presenting here the results more for Europe and more specifically Western Europe. Uh, another, in terms of stimulation of innovation, we can talk about uh, autonomous vehicles. And it was interesting that in the workshops we, we did to inform the design of these scenarios, there was an interesting discussion here. And for instance, that this is one of those measures that either really takes off or only as a very marginal uh, deployment. So in the current ambition, indeed, it's a very marginal deployment that takes place. In an high ambition, uh, it will take, uh, it will be in wider utilization, wider deployment. And I, I would say also that it's a measure that has uh, pros and cons from a decarbonization perspective. But if it comes up in the discussion, we can go more into it. And finally, in these measures, this is not exactly a measure. This is one of these external factors I think Laurie was talking about. And we have the decarbonization of energy. Uh, it's actually first showed in the ITF in uh, decarbonizing maritime reports, I think from 2018. Uh, and we have to understand that fossil fuels now in the total freight activity, global freight activity measured in TKMs, Fossil fuels estimated by us, but this is validated by, validated by other sources too. Fossil fuels account for 30%, a third almost. Um, so if we move into a world where energy production, where eating, where transport itself is less reliant in fossil fuels, this will have an impact, of course, a sizable impact in the in demand for freight transport. And in the current ambition, this follows uh, the, the trade, the underlying trade assumptions that we, the, or estimates that we have in the model, uh, which is the end linkages model of the end directorate of the OECD. And in this case, uh, the fossil fuels still grow, but grow at a lower pace than other types of commodities. But in a high ambition uh, scenario, this, uh, there is a cut and a reduction uh, compared to nowadays in the consumption of fossil fuels. Uh, now, just talking about the, the activity and how it will evolve and it will grow. And here I'm focusing, it's also this study is very focused on Europe. So this first result is just for surface transport, land transport, rail, road and inland waterways. And we see that it will, um, it will still grow in Europe, surface activity up to 2050, especially in the period between 2030 and 2050. Uh, it still grows, must be said, uh, less than in the rest, uh, for the rest of the world. Um, and that there is a slight difference, slight, it's a 9% difference between current ambition and high ambition. In, I, uh, in current ambition, there's nine, in 2050, 9% more, uh, more TKMs than in the high ambition scenario. Uh, 
this is now the transport associated with imports and exports from and to Europe. And here a very interesting dynamic takes place. Nowadays, most of this transport activity is associated with imports. But by 2050, in both scenarios, it will be associated with exports. And this actually, this happens in both scenarios, but more so for the high ambition scenario, where actually ex exports in Europe will be slight, not much, it's almost the same, but there is a slightly increase of European exports. And this is the only region of the world where this actually result takes place. And there is a, a further decrease of uh, import. And looking where in the world this, um, this happens, these uh, imports from and to Europe, you can see here, this is the, how the exports evolve to Asia. The first column is 2015. The other two are 2050 in the current ambition and I ambition. And we can see here, I mean, Asia is where most of the growth in European exports will come from. And in terms of imports, there is uh, this result from the transition countries where the imports in I ambitions in 2050 will be less than in 2015. There's a reduction from what happens now. And the same dynamic, uh, a bit less, but the same dynamic happens in the Middle East and North Africa, from the Middle East and North, North Africa region, where the imports into Europe uh, in 2050 will be less than, into, than they are now. And of course, I already mentioned this, and this happens because of this uh, decarbonization of the economy. And so uh, uh, decrease in the share of fossil fuels in the imports into Europe. And you can see here, this graph shows uh, in blue in the bottom, dark blue, it's the, it's the fossil fuels um, component of the import related transport. And while nowadays it's almost F, of transport is related to into Europe, imports into Europe is related. Um, and this is actually in this one, it, it also includes intra European movements. Almost half of these uh, movements uh, are related to fossil fuels, but they will drop to 16% uh, in the high ambition uh, in 2050. Uh, very brief, briefly on how the model shift, uh, model split will evolve. Here we see the results for the this import export uh, surface movements. Um, these are longer distance movements, and in this case, uh, rail by 2050 will overtake road, which is still the predominant mode used for this this type of movements. Um, and this, of course, this excludes C. You have to mention this. Most of these movements uh, are actually done by C, more than 90%. But here I'm just showing the split in the surface, uh, in the surface modes. But when we look uh, not at this import-export uh, just, but all the surface transport, including domestic, that takes place into Europe, uh, we'll see that road will still be the, the main mode. Uh, uh, by 2050, um, although there is still an increase of uh, of rail uh, around 10 percent uh, from 2015 to now, and actually the difference between the two scenarios in terms of modal split is not very significant, a couple of percentage points, and that is oh, and the reason why is also there's uh, several measures in the road freight sector measures that will help decarbonize that sector, but also increase in some ways the, its competitiveness. So, and that's the reason behind this re result. And just um, on the activity, a final load, uh, note on how this is distributed across Europe. And we'll see that there is a concentration in the more central regions of Europe. In everywhere across the board, there is a tendency to increase 
between 2015 and 2015 and 50 but it's here in the west region central west and northwest where the growths are more significant although this is not so much driven by the decarbonization measures themselves but by the underlying gdp and trade estimates that we that we use but it's still something to take into account um, now moving to the emissions and what we see is that in the and this is for surface transport in the current ambition, there is still a decrease. Actually, Europe is the only region in the world where this happens, where there's a slight decrease, a 9% decrease uh, between 15 and 50. Uh, and there's a more significant decrease in the high ambition scenario, which is actually 72 per, it's a 72% reduction compared to the 2015 value. And this result by the, the non-urban freight sector helps Europe achieve the overall target of redu redu uh, reducing by 60% its transport emission, emissions when compared to 1990. It helps achieve this target, although the more ambitions, ambitious Green Deal target is not achieved for the overall transportation sector. Uh, and most of this, is actually explained by this graph. And then if I have, if we have time in the debate, I'll, I'll come back to some of the questions that Lori posed in this presentation. But here, the decrease in carbon intens intensity of the, and in this case, it's the surface modes. It's what explains most of these reductions. And you can see that road is by far the most carbon intensive mode, but it will have, uh, there will be a big and a substantial decrease in its carbon intensity that's driven by uh, more efficient vehicles, uh, more stringent regulation, energy transition of um, long haul distance vehicles, also asset sharing, better, uh, an old set of heavy capacity vehicles being implemented in some routes. So all of this leads to this result. Although we'll say even in other modes, for instance, in rail, by 2050, uh, it will be it would be carbon neutral, at least thanks to real emissions would be zero, uh, with most of the network electrified and other solutions like hydrogen, hydrogen or batteries applied in stretches that are not or in terminal operations. Uh, here, I just I showed this graph. This is the emissions associated with these imports and exports now, and. It follows the dynamics that I showed for the activity, but I show this here for a reason is that if you noticed here, the values on the, uh, in the I axis, these values are actually much higher than the surface emissions in Europe. But this is a European almost singularity because for the world, globally surface emissions are higher than import and export. But uh, and in actually, if you look at the U USA and Canada region, surface is doubles the the emissions are the double than um, this import export related. But in Europe, it's exactly the opposite, and this is something to also bear in mind. And I'll I'll uh, start concluding here, moving to this discussion about equity about the side effects impacts on competitiveness other sectors uh, equity can be assessed uh, on different dimensions uh, with our modelings our freight modelings uh, the results uh, that we obtain it's easier to assess the spatial distribution of effects and the region regional balances and unbalances of the effects of these measures and one result we can show here, it's the effects that this decarbonization measures and other trends too must be added, F on the average export costs for different regions of the world. And I say average costs with the big cave at, which is most of this, these costs don't include most of the costs with infrastructure. So all the infrastructure deployment required for this decarbonization measures uh, is not included here. This is mostly uh, the costs from, a, it's an operational perspective or an end user perspective of the costs. 
And what we see is that Europe is the region where, in the high ambition scenario, cost reduction will actually decrease and decrease the most compared to 2015. It's also the region of the world where the decarbonization measures will be more ambitious and implemented uh, with more ambition. The flip side, this is good news for Europe, I would say, the, the flip side from an equity perspective and how this transition is perceived is that we see here a region like the Middle East and North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa with very substantial increases in their costs. And this is driven not only by the lag in the implementation of these decarbonization measures or carbon, the carbon taxes, etc. There's other factors that explain this, uh, like, for instance, the evolution of GDP per capita, but the lag in the, the, uh, in the deployment of decarbonization measures also plays an effect. Because from an operational cost perspective, many of these decarbonization measures uh, have a positive effect in decrease, decreasing maintenance, decreasing fuel costs, so uh, increased efficiency. Um, so we see here a bit of a, a bit no, a very strong disparity between regions. And I want to go through all of these key insights. I think I've mentioned most of the things that uh, are highlighted here. I'll just, uh, of course, COVID-19, it's the elephant in, in the room. We cannot uh, <laughs> avoid it. Uh, and this is also taken in account in this uh, in the modeling in the in our modeling framework. In specific, uh, the way that this is uh, this was accounted was pre predominantly by uh, the effects that this has on GDP on the underlying uh, estimates that drive these results. Many of these results, which especially for activity, which are the effects on GDP and on the on trade which will still, of course, grow in the long term, but which won't grow as much as previously foreseen. And this impacts, of course, also demand, uh, especially co and compared to previous estimates, for instance, the ones that the ITF did for this outlook in 2019, there is uh, a slowdown in, uh, in global demand. Although I must say, that for surface activity in Europe, uh, the result in this case, there's almost no change. I mean, it's basically the same. But for the globe, for global transport, there is indeed a slowdown uh, in, in this demand. Um, and as a follow up to the discussion, and uh, before I return the word to, to Olaf, uh, I'll just uh, leave here what are some of the questions that uh, are particular re particularly relevant for us in this discussion these are only teasers or for this discussion but um, the policy implicate overall policy implications and feasibility of these scenarios are things that of course are important to come out of this um, of this discussion this the report that olaf mentioned that we just uh, delivered uh, to the European Commission. It's a report very focused on the results, but we have now this opportunity to discuss what are the policy implications that come out of this, what is the, what is the, uh, in fact the feasibility of this, uh, of these scenarios. Um, and I would say the policy implications and feasibility, not only of these scenarios, but of other even al alternative pathways and Lori here presented this in the, uh, uh, exposed this in his first initial presentation. Also the issue of equity and the differentiated impacts we alluded to regions, but there's also differentiated impacts, for instance, in, the, in businesses. Uh, how, how can this impact the market structure of the sector? For instance, are these, some of these changes favoring a market concentration or not? And which effects this, uh, this might have. Um, the issue of resilience. Uh, which Laurie already alluded to in, uh, in, the, in his presentation. And last also reflection we can have on Europe's role, not only of inter-European cooperation, but the Europe's role in the world. As we see in Europe in terms of these international movements as a very important place 
actually it's the second both in imports and exports after Asia it's the second region and so um, how can policies in Europe uh, and even the example that Europe sets also influence uh, the rest of the world so I'll leave it with this and uh, Olaf and thank you everybody just a small note if I'm allowed in the end just a, a small note to Jonathan Leap. I think you saw him in the previous uh, session, but uh, just a word uh, that he also helped in the processing of data, developing of indicators for the for this sector too. So, great. Many thanks, uh, Francisco, for uh, presentation of this, uh, this important work. And um, let me remind everybody of you um, that is at uh, this moment uh, looking at uh, and participating in, in this uh, session. Of course, you're more than welcome to, uh, if there's any questions that you have in, in the Q&A box uh, in, uh, in Zoom. Um, of course, there might be questions on the work that Francisco has just presented, the scenarios, uh, the model, the measures, etc. So please feel free to, uh, to ask these, uh, these questions. Um, I think what we'll do now is uh, leave any questions that you have for, uh, for Lori or for Francisco to uh, a little bit later stage and uh, introduce you now to, uh, to the four panelists that we have in, uh, in subsequent, uh, subsequent order. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Elizabeth Werner, who is a Director for Land Transport at uh, the DG Move of the, uh, the European Commission. Um, Elizabeth, you, you have been hearing this, uh, this presentation, uh, you've seen the scenarios, and my question to you is, uh, is actually, uh, what would be your comment on these city scenarios? Do they make sense to you as a, as a policymaker? And, uh, and are they actually relevant for the policy work that you're, you're doing? Thank you very much uh, for having me today. I think uh, these scenarios are extremely relevant to us in the European Commission. There is essentially two reasons. The first one is that um, this week, hot off the press, we presented our strategy for smart and sustainable mobility. We also deal with the resilience of the transport system in there. That's basically our vision of how transport needs to transform to meet the wider Green Deal objectives. And then of course, we are in high ambition because this morning the European Council managed to agree that the greenhouse gas emissions should um, reduce by 55% by 2030 below the 1990 values. Um, I've listened very carefully. I've also read some of the documents before. Uh, by way of introduction, what I want to really say here is that we as a commission feel we need to work on three fronts at the same time. The first one is to make all the transport modes more sustainable. And here the question of the fuels, the question of the efficiency of the engines is extremely important. We want to be technology neutral, but we cannot rely on technology alone. So the second leg on which we need to work is making the sustainable alternatives more attractive and more widely available. That goes hand in hand, of course, with investments and the big role for railways and for the inland waterways has been highlighted in the presentation. And the third one is that we need to put in place the right incentives for this to happen. And this is where all the work on pricing, on taxation, on carbon pricing, on infrastructure charging comes in. Because in DG Move, we want, of course, the transport sector to prosper. We do not want to see any kind of restrictions or prohibitions or limitations. Um, and this is why we bank on the polluter pace and user pace principles for making these scenarios happen. I think I'll stop here and I hope I'll have more opportunity to tell you about all the various things that we have in the pipeline because we have an extremely 
ambitious work program presented here with uh, more than 80 proposals coming very soon. Back to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Elizabeth. And, and maybe uh, you, can, you can tell us indeed a little bit more on, uh, on, on that work that, uh, that you just uh, released this, uh, this week, that, uh, that report, uh, maybe also answering to a question that, uh, that Francisco put in his, his presentation, where he basically asked, well, what is the role of, uh, of the EU in, in the world? Uh, and uh, while trying to translate that question a little bit in my, uh, my, my views, uh, what is, let's say, what are the measures that the, the EU is most uh, appropriate to, uh, to, to do? What is the relevant intervention level and, and how does that fit into your EU agenda? Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me perhaps start with trying to reply to the question. The role of the EU in the world is a high ambition role where we want to set the scene. And while we are primarily talking about targets for within the EU, we fully realize that standards that we set, especially technological standards, are very influential in the world. And we're very proud about uh, European mobility and transport system because of its safety record, because of its quality record, being a standard setter in the world. So this is where vehicle standards, fuel standards, energy efficiency standards, obviously will positively influence developments and competitiveness aspects of the industry worldwide. Coming back to your first question on what are all the actions, and I, I'm really um, worried about falling into a too long expose or a list of items, and I strongly invite you to go to our dedicated website and have a look at the mobility strategy. But by and large, as I said, there is um, several groups of um, uh, flagship initiatives that we want to work on. So first of all is incentivizing the uptake of low and zero emission vehicles and the use of renewable and low carbon fuels, where very, very quickly now we will come with a proposal um, on alternative fuels infrastructure, so tackling the charging and fueling aspects, which will be um, much more mandatory than anything we had in the past. And we have clearly also announced our objective of 3 million charging station. Um, there will be fast charging stations, etc. There will also be a revision of the CO2 standards for road vehicles, cars, vans, and heavy duty vehicles with more stringent air pollution standards for combustion engine vehicles um, to future proof this image. Transport fuels also will be addressed. They must become carbon neutral and more sustainable. Um, we have battery and hydrogen initiatives already launched, but uh, I think most relevant here will be the revision um, of the renewable energy directive. So as we, we said clearly in our strategy that for road transport, we see electricity and hydrogen as the most promising options. But of course, this will be a mode specific analysis. And I think even within the road sector, we clearly see different segments, um, the long haul, the short haul, uh, the heavy duty vehicles um, that have um, different requirements and where also the technology is less mature. That's why we will also look into other questions, for instance, how we can um, work, as was uh, said here, uh, about more efficiency, better loading capacity is one aspect here, but generally reducing waiting times, reducing congestion times, but also the weights and dimensions of the vehicles is something we want to look at. But separately, of course, in these um, studies, uh, you have seen very high ambition for, for rail freight in particular. For rail freight, um, we think that we have a very good framework, legal framework in place now, but it's not yet fully implemented. It's extremely important that all kinds of technical and operational obstacles that remain for the cross-border operations are quickly eliminated. We, we still don't have the same possibility for a train to run throughout Europe uh, than 
for a track, for instance, to run throughout Europe. We also see here the digitalization is extremely important, not only um, within railway with, um, you know, traffic management systems, automated train operations that could come digital automatic couplings, but also um, to make this link between road transport and rail transport and inland waterways smooth. So my, my director general, he refers to the digitalization as the glue that makes um, the different modes of transport stick together much better. Obviously, in, in physical terms, this glue is also terminals. So we will be focusing very much um, on intermodal transport and on the role of terminals, but also on the role of um, digital exchange tools, for instance, the electronic freight transport information. Um, and the third block of things that we will work on are the economic instruments. So I alluded, this is the charges, but also, of course, carbon prices and um, taxation questions. We want to push for better price signals. I, you're probably um, aware of our 2019 study on the external costs of transport. So for us, that is still a very, very essential element. And I'm extremely pleased that it looks like our road charging directive, famous Oro vignette, will finally make progress. And in there, charging for lorries, for trucks, will be based on CO2 emissions. That's very good. Um, we're a bit disappointed because it's less ambitious than our original proposal as regards moving to distance-based charging and there's still a possibility for time-based charging. Uh, we also think there is a big issue about transparency actually to influence the behavior and we want to work on um, really simple environmental footprint indicators and perhaps also on a label to show which transport of goods um, is more sustainable than others, um, simply because we believe that there is a, lot, a strong willingness and desire, in fact, um, of, of shippers, but also of consumers, of course, to act more sustainably. But it is hard for non-experts to make an informed judgment. Uh, this is, um, I think, I what just, I want to say on yeah. these aspects, and perhaps later we can come back also on the questions of equity and of resilience that I think are equally important, especially after our COVID experience. Back to you, Olaf. Yeah, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for this, uh, this overview of what the, the EU is doing. I thought it was important to, uh, to know of that, of course, as well. Um, we now uh, go to uh, our second uh, panelist, um, who is uh, Lucy Anderson, uh, the head of the sustainability unit of the International Union of, uh, of Railways. Um, of course, uh, we have heard uh, about railways in the different presentations. Um, and my question to you, Lucy, would be, do you recognize, well, first of all, the scenarios, but also the measures that were mentioned uh, in, the, uh, in the presentation of uh, Francisco? And what would you consider to be the crucial measure for the real trade sector? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, well, well, thank you for inviting us um, firstly, and it's really interesting to be part of this debate, and it's really interesting to, to read about these scenarios, um, and, the, and they're aligned to, to what we've been thinking, um, particularly in our work with Rail Freight Forward. Um, um, we've, in our white paper, we talked about a 30% modal shift um, by 30, 2030, so then that 50 by 50% really, really works, I think. And, and, and I think it's been clear in the, in the introduction today um, that rail is, going to, is, is, is on track for that um, uh, carbon neutrality. Um, and so the most obvious and important way to really uh, decarbonize railways, uh, decarbonize transport uh, is, that, is that significant modal shift to rail. Um, and and, and uh, the biggest sort of effective way of doing that is, is that intermodality um, and, and improving the way that we connect with other modes to really fix that like last mile door to door issue that um, uh, we think is probably one of the biggest um, 
areas that stifle that that modal shift. Um, and, and I think, uh, but some of the economic um, measures that um, that Elizabeth already been talking about, I think, are really important as well. Um, so, so for example, um, yeah, pricing in those externalities um, are um, really, really important. So, carbon pricing will help. Um, and also looking at, for example, um, track access charges that rail freight pay. So, essentially. Uh, rail freight pays for every kilometre that they travel, just like you would on a, on a, a toll road. Um, but of course, that's not quite the case for all modes. So to sort of reduce those kind of um, track access charges would really help um, on, because at the moment there's a bit of a distortion that um, makes it more expensive um, to travel by rail freight from that. And there's, but there's also admin. Um, you know, there's sort of 15 times more documents needed to run a, a, a railway train than uh, uh, freight than it is to um, to run a truck. So perhaps there's something there to really help um, the smooth running and e you know the ease of using rail freight as well. Great, thank you. Uh, and we'll of course come back to you with some other questions uh, later in, in this panel. Um, we now turn to our third panelist, uh, which is Professor Alan McKinnon. Uh, he's professor at the Logistics University. Uh, and also, uh, of course, the author of, of the book Decarbonizing Logistics um, that was already mentioned by, uh, by, by Laurie. Um, Alan, um, I was wondering, you have uh, an overview of the, of the whole logistics sector. You treated that in your, in your, in your book, of course. Uh, and I was wondering, are there modes that you think are more advanced? Uh, uh, and are there also modes that need to do more? And, and if so, uh, what should policymakers do with that? Thank you, uh, Olav, and thanks for inviting me to participate. Um, I, I'd just like to begin by, by thanking Laurie for his uh, wonderful presentation. I jotted down some points in advance, and he addressed them all. Um, so, um, great, the foresight there. Um, you're asking specifically about modes. Um, uh, I mean, my, my view, is, as, as Laurie articulated, I thought very well, is, is that we have these five sets of initiatives that we will have to deploy really to achieve these deep reductions in CO2 emissions. Um, and we have to pull them all to full stretch. Um, my worry is that there's a preoccupation with some of these levers, um, particularly mode split. Um, I, I read the uh, mobility strategy uh, document that's just come out, uh, where it, it appears to equate the greening of freight transport with modal shift. Now, no question, modal shift will make a contribution, but we have to be honest and realistic about this. Um, I had a, a feeling of deja vu in reading that report, because if you go back and look at the EU's white paper of 2001, 2011, again, very ambitious targets for getting more freight onto the railways, and it simply hasn't happened. As, as Laurie explained, I mean, there's been a flatlining of the rail freight share. Um, so what we have to do is to see why the policy initiatives in the past did not work, and then ask ourselves, you know, what is going to change? What's going to be so different over the next 10 years to make things different, to allow the railways to increase their market share by 30%, or, or as it says in the uh, mobility document, 50% uh, growth in, in the traffic volume. And I think the other thing we have to recognize is that um, the initiatives which are going to decarbonize trucking will also reduce the, the cost of trucking per ton kilometer, um, which is going to make it harder for the railways and the inland waterways to capture more of the, of the freight market. So we have to look at that interaction between the set of policy initiatives to um, you know, decarbonize road freight and the, the consequences that will have for, for decarbonization. And, and, and one of the, the strengths, I think, one of the many strengths of the ITF analysis is that they have had, they try to address that interrelationship um, in their modeling. Um, and, and, and looking at the road freight sector, I mean, it seems, and this came across very strongly in, in Laurie's uh, presentation, that we have to act quickly. I mean, we cannot wait for a shift to low carbon powertrains to deliver net zero. Uh, we, we have to um, apply what I, I consider to be demand management measures in the short to medium term to, to drive down um, vehicle kilometers, to drive down energy use in the road freight sector. Um, and that will then reduce the amount of energy that we, we have to switch to renewables at a later stage uh, as well. Um, 
And if I could just mention briefly a, a study which we've recently done uh, with the European Freight and Logistics Leaders Forum, uh, where we've surveyed about 90 big companies across Europe, uh, asking them about their decarbonisation strategies for logistics. Um, and a, a lot of very positive messages there. I mean, it seems to me in the industry community, there has been a step change in the level of commitment to cutting freight related uh, emissions. Um, uh, and, and incidentally, if you look at the, the, the two main ways in which they feel cost effectively, we can decarbonize uh, European logistics. The, number one is actually modal shift, right? So the industry is actually keen to see a significant shift to, to rail. But the second thing is loading the vehicles better. Because as Laurie said, there's still a lot of empty running. Uh, vehicles are, are only partially loaded. Um, things like digitalization will almost certainly help here, but we, we need companies to be prepared to collaborate more, to, to share their assets, uh, you know, if we're going to achieve in the medium term significant reductions in CO2 emissions. Um, so there's just some introductory thoughts on the, on the question that you posed to me, Olaf. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Alan. Uh, you um, managed to raise a lot of, a lot of points. Um, uh, raised a different speakers, and maybe we have an opportunity to talk about that in uh, further a little bit in a, our uh, in our discussion. Um, one of the things you mentioned was also the concern with with, with model shift. Um, maybe that's also something that our next panelist would like to like to address. That is um, Raluca Marian, who is the general delegate of the permanent delegation to the EU at the International Road Transport uh, Union, uh, and indeed. Uh, our question is, uh, is, is the same as we also asked to, uh, to, to Lucy. Do you recognize the measures that are uh, in, the, in the, the, the scenario? Does that make, does that make sense to you? Uh, and what do you think is the most important measure to take in the road transport sector? Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you a lot. Um, so we recognize many of the measures. Uh, we don't recognize some of the measures. Um, what, what we are, what we, we really um, can confirm, and this is fully in line with, uh, with our vision on decarbonization, we cannot bat on only one tool on, on, uh, or on only one policy. It's a combination of measures which will, uh, um, which will um, help everybody achieve the change. Uh, so it's um, not only the vehicle, uh, it's also digitalization. Uh, it's also low hanging fruits, as we call them, like uh, high capacity vehicles. Um, it's also uh, driver training, uh, so it's, it's a combination of, uh, of all of this. Um, that's something we recognize. Uh, something that we, um, we don't, uh, not necessarily recognize because it's a, uh, as Professor McKinnon said, it's a, it's a long-standing trend, but we, we cannot agree with is this almost unique focus we see in the EU policy, but we also see it quite strongly in, uh, in, the, in the report, in the study, is this model shift. Um, our vision is more to focus on modal cooperation, on interoperability between modes, and we are still uh, experiencing quite a lot of uh, uh, challenges with interoperability. So uh, solving these issues will help because we are all needed. Um, we saw the decrease in demand, which is quite debatable, most likely we'll have an increase in demand, so we are all needed. So let's not focus only on one and uh, let's make all of us um, uh, lower carbon and even zero emissions. Now, uh, just a, a quick consideration on the strategy, which we cannot uh, miss because it, it just came. Uh, we are still a little bit in shock to see that uh, in the strategy, we heard in Elizabeth comments and we know that uh, when we talk to Elizabeth at, at, at this level, uh, there is a clear recognition on the different segments of the transport and different needs and technology limitations for different segments, but we are a little bit in shock to see in the strategy that there is no difference between a car and a truck or a car and a heavy duty truck. And there is no transition and no uh, policy for transition in, in terms of, uh, uh, of heavy duty vehicles. And that's a little bit concerning for us. Um, so we will see how this will be solved in, in practice. We will see also the alternative fuel infrastructure initiative, which will come in the EU. Uh, we'll see the energy tax. Uh, these are all priorities for us as well. Uh, now coming just a little bit also to the report, uh, as I am, we don't see electricity as being really the solution for long distance. So that's also a point of, uh, of divergence, let's say with, uh, with the report. Hydrogen, yes, but again, uh, longer term. 
So uh, let's see how everything uh, develops, but uh, we have some concerns from based on what we saw in uh, the recent uh, strategy. Thank you, thank you, uh, Raluca, for your uh, for your remarks, your intervention. Uh, Clearly, uh, the EU strategy uh, provokes uh, some uh, some reactions. Of course, we're not here actually to discuss that strategy. Of course, it is still related to uh, to the uh, the IDF work. Uh, but I suppose there is going to be other also other uh, discussions that are, that are going to take place specifically about the EU strategy. Nevertheless, of course, it uh, it is interesting for for our discussion. Now, um, some uh, panelists already alluded to, uh, let's say, the, uh, the other issues we'd like to discuss today, uh, resilience, um, equity, uh, all very large subjects, uh, of course. So, so uh, I don't have an illusion that we'll, we'll get um, very far or very deep uh, talking about that, but uh, it would be interesting, of course, to have a, a very quick take from all panelists on, uh, on these, uh, these two, uh, two issues. Um, I'll start with uh, with Lucy uh, with the question uh, basically uh, if and how real transportation could, uh, could contribute to a more resilient freight transport system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's it's uh, it's something that um, uh, railways are pretty good at in terms of perturbation. So that because they have a sort of system view um, the, and, and um, sort of systematic communications and signaling, they're able to sort of redirect and, 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 and change to the sort of emergency procedures and things like that. So I think it's, uh, it's something that rail is really good at, but will be much, much better equipped um, if more connected to, um, to other, the other modes. So I think it's, it's been mentioned today already, it's that interconnectedness and intermodal will um, will solve lots and lots of problems, um, including enabling that modal shift, um, but but also that uh, that resilience that we really need um, to be able to sort of um, react to those changes in a, um, uh, in all sorts of different conditions, which uh, more and more we're, we're, we're expected to see, aren't we, in, in terms of climate change adaptation and resilience, and weather and more extreme weather events. So, yeah. Um, we, I would propose that yeah, the intermodality and increasing connectivity with other modes is the most important thing we can do for resilience. Thank you, uh, Lucy. I was <clears throat> uh, interested to hear uh, Alan's, Alan's view on this, basically also trying to understand if there is a relation between the demand for more resilience and uh, the efforts to decarbonize uh, lo the logistics sector. Is there, is there a link or are these unconnected uh, issues? Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I would draw people's attention to uh, our, our own table that the ITF organized a couple of years ago, which I had the pleasure of moderating, which addressed that issue. To, to what extent there was a, a correlation between efforts to uh, not, not just improve uh, resilience and sustainability, but also just improve economic efficiency because often these things are considered to be in, in conflict. So there's a report on the ITF website on this. Um, just um, if, if we think of what's happened recently on this front, uh, there's been a lot of discussion in, in the trade and the business press about the COVID experience causing companies to attach more importance to resilience, um, possibly reversing the process of globalization, uh, reshoring more production into Europe, um, localizing more of their sourcing, um, to make their supply chains less vulnerable. Um, and if that were to happen, uh, almost certainly there would be an environmental and a CO2 benefit, I think, from that happening. It's debatable to what extent it will happen. It will impact, I think, more in some sectors than others. Um, there's also been some discussion as to whether the just-in-time principle, you know, which has been this pretty fundamental business paradigm now, that has been with us for several decades, um, the extent to which that might be relaxed in an effort to improve supply chain resilience. Um, now, as many of you will know, I think just in time has been accused of being one of the main causes of vehicles being underloaded because companies sacrifice transport efficiency to minimize their inventory levels. So again, if in this drive to improve uh, resilience, we do see a relaxation of just in time pressures, then that again could translate into better vehicle fill and uh, reduced uh, CO2 emissions as well. Um, uh, but going back to what Laurie was saying, um, as he said, if, if in an effort to improve the carbon efficiency of road, 
uh, we uh, reduce the number of vehicles, uh, we, we load them better, we, we maybe reduce the amount of uh, slack in the system, uh, again, that would have the opposite effect. So it's very hard to come up with a general conclusion here because we've got forces pushing in different directions and it's hard to see what the net effect is going to be. Great, <clears throat> thank you, uh, thank you, Alan. Um, now it's time to, to turn back again to, uh, to Elizabeth uh, Werner. Um, of course, uh, we're also interested in your take on, on equity and, and, and resilience, um, but maybe on, uh, on equity, equity first, um, you stated that the EU wants to be a high ambition actor, uh, and of course, that that also raises the question: What will then be the uh, the impact for 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 exporters and importers within the EU? But maybe also, is there going to be an impact on on different regions uh, within the EU? Thank you. Yes, I think that for us as the as the EU, the biggest challenge is indeed the the disparities or the different starting positions uh, among different regions in Europe, among different countries in Europe. Um, and that is very closely linked, of course, to the quality of infrastructure. Uh, here we see a major, major challenge for us to really come to an upgraded and interconnected infrastructure that provides the same opportunities in different parts of Europe. Uh, now, this is exactly also um, one reason why there is uh, an enormous amount of uh, EU budget being made available um, for modernizing infrastructure in Europe. And I want to here in particular underline the ongoing efforts about the reform plans. We have asked as a commission member states um, to prepare reform plans uh, to come out stronger after the COVID uh, crisis, um, making best use of the EU budget funds uh, being available under the recovery and resilience facility. And in these reform plans, member states are invited to set out how they can link investments and reform to have a digital and sustainable transformation. So we very much hope that transport is very prominently represented there and that uh, this is the way for the different member states to make a good use of this unprecedented occasion to accelerate change that they were going to do anyway, hopefully. Yeah? So um, here, obviously, rail infrastructure is very expensive and it takes a long time to build it. But the advantage of railways is really where it transports high volumes, high weight along the main European axis. And that's very much at the heart of our thinking of trans-European transport corridors. And then, of course, these corridors need to be linked into a wider transportation system and they need to be well connected with the ports, they need to be terminals. And um, I don't see at all any antagonism between railways and road transports or inland, trans inland waterways because they are um, perfectly complementary. Uh, road transport um, is absolutely required and will always be needed for the questions of accessibility. And our ambitions is not to build railway connections to the last mountainous village that there is in Europe. So from that point of view, I think there is enough space for every transport mode um, to prosper. Uh, and that, that actually leads directly to the question of the resilience. I found the presentation very, very interesting um, because in the COVID-19 in spring this year, we have seen the value added of having different transport modes uh, when um, planes stayed on the ground and trucks lined up at the borders, railways continued to function. But equally, we saw containers piling up in certain parts of Europe and not being available in other parts of the world. So there is a need for a certain redundancy. Um, and I think we need to be pre prepared for different kinds of crises. It's very clear that there will be more climate-related weather crisis, which is also a big challenge for our infrastructure. We have, we have or we are drawing um, some lessons from a pandemic where very clearly digitalization and automation are coming out 
as the solution. But um, I think we need to imagine also that uh, the threat could be a cyber terrorism, in which case uh, we would draw the opposite conclusion and fall back on more manual and human interventions. Uh, so absolutely on the resilience, I think it proves once more that we need a, a multimodal, a synchromodal system. Back to you. Yes, thank you very much. And um, of course, I'm now going to, to ask the same question on resilience and equity also to, uh, to, to, to Raluca. Um, but basically also asking you, well, um, how can road transport uh, contribute to more resili resilience in the transport sector whilst decarbonizing at the same time? Um, regarding the resilience of the sector in general, and uh, thank you for, uh, to Elizabeth for, for mentioning uh, the, the corona pandemics. I think our, our sector demonstrated in full uh, the resilience uh, uh, given these very, very uh, difficult conditions we, we had to, to cope with. Uh, now, linking this to, uh, to the environment, um, we, we are a resilient sector, but we, what we also need is consistent and uh, achievable policies in order to know in what to invest. And um, coherent messages uh, in terms of uh, technology choices uh, would help. So uh, low carbon fuels as a transition, for example, in our view, should be encouraged and not discouraged since in, uh, we, we don't have yet, uh, let's say in full scale, the other technologies. So um, that's what we need a bit of uh, more support, uh, let's say, and more coherence from a legislative perspective to help our resilience and our investments. Because it's difficult to invest in something, you know, it won't be accepted uh, in some years from now on, although you don't have an alternative. Thank you, uh, Maraluka. And um, I remind everyone uh, that uh, there is a possibility to ask uh, specific questions to specific panelists or the, the presenters that we, that we had. Some of the questions are, are coming in uh, and we'll, uh, we'll ask them to, uh, to, to the people. But maybe before, um, before doing that, um, I'd like to go back to, to Francisco, um, who of course presented the scenarios, um, heard several panelists refer to that, recognizing um, uh, certain things, maybe not other things. Um, Francisco, is there something you would like to, to respond to the different, uh, different elements that have been, have been raised by, uh, by the panelists? Hi, Olaf, thank you for, uh, for giving this opportunity. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, of questions uh, I could address, and then maybe I'll also give the word to the, uh, my colleague uh, Luis Martinez, which was the, uh, is the main brain behind the, the ITF modeling framework development, if he also wants to add and complement with any information. But I actually would start with the, just a very small precision on uh, one thing in these scenarios, uh, we talk about the energy transition for long haul uh, heavy vehicles, um, but we do not, and we include ver various options in that measure. So it could be electric roads, it could be hydrogen, it could be clean biofuels, uh, just to make a precision on, uh, on that. And another, Small note too is that, and I think Alan mentioned that, I think one of the strengths of the ITF work is exactly the ability of, of uh, taking measures that sometimes can be seen as contradictory uh, or sometimes at first not, but that uh, running them through this integrated model modeling framework, you can really assess, okay, but what is the end result in terms of emissions, in terms of activity, in terms of regional distribution of impacts? And so this is a thing that we pride ourselves uh, a lot. Uh, about, I would just make one short note now on the impact of external measures and Laurie alluded to them and 3D printing is in the model. I mentioned the decarbonization of, um, of the energy system in general and how that would impact, uh, how would that impact uh, transport? And, but the fact is that this is, at least for surface transport in Europe, uh, 
these exogenous factors will not be the main driver to achieve the, at least the 2011 roadmap uh, European targets. Uh, the, main, uh, the main driver of this result would be indeed the several efficiency and technological measures that, uh, and uh, operational measures that would uh, increase average loads, that would uh, decrease the carbon intensity of the, of the transport sector in general. So this is, uh, and this includes a bit of model shift, but also measures like the capacity vehicles for road freight altogether. Um, and what I show here in the graph is the 60% below 90 level uh, of emissions. And this assuming the same freight emissions in 2015 and 1990, which is a bold assumption, but just to have a figure, a reference. And then I have here, what are the emissions in current ambition for surface transport? What are the emissions in high ambition? And what would be the emissions uh, with the carbon intensity of high ambition, but the activity of current ambition. And you see, yes, there is an increase, which is the increase in activity of about 90%, but it, you're still within that uh, target. Uh, and just a brief word, I think this is also important on the, um, on the discussion, if we are offsetting to other sectors, if by decarbonizing transport, aren't we just offsetting these emissions to uh, other sectors? And in fact, uh, this does take place uh, a bit uh, because um, you see here that the, in, this, in this graph, you see the tank to wheel emissions in blue and the well to tank in green. Um, and you see the share of well to tank, the upstream component of emissions does increase. Nowadays, we estimate in 24%, but it will increase in, in the high ambition, it will be 40%. So this is a substantial increase in the share. And also in terms of absolute values, for instance, in surface transport, in tank to wheel, and you can see a bit by this graph itself, there is a decrease in green in current ambitions. It's a slight decrease, but it's a 9% decrease. While if we consider also the well to tank, there is no decrease in emissions. I mean, there's actually a slight, it's almost nothing, but there is a slight increase. And in the high ambitions, there's still a substantial decrease. I must say it's a 61% if we take the total emissions, but this is less than if we just consider tank to wheel. So I would leave with these two notes and um, or precisions if you want and i would just say if i don't know if my colleague uh, Luis wants to add anything now if not uh, thank you francisco uh, this is what i wanted also to to highlight uh, this uh, balance between tank to wheel and wheel to tank that you just raised now that this is important because some of the comments were on that line and i just we wanted to highlight that yes we have to be aware that there is always a, a Copper, uh, a connection between the different sectors. If we don't have the grid, electricity grid clean, then we may have a problem or even the, the, the alternative fuels um, options. Then uh, this, I think it's mainly this. And I, I would say that the reality for Europe on the freight sector, it might be differ a little bit from other regions. And uh, we'll go in the future to go in much more detail also what we the outcome also call, um, correlated with the measures that are implemented in Europe in other areas in the world in our uh, 2021 outlook, which uh, align for Europe these uh, scenarios that we post here. Great, thank you very much, uh, Luis and Francisco for these, uh, these clarifications and answers to uh, the questions that were raised by, by the panelists. Um, we now have a little bit of time for questions from uh, from the audience. Uh, I, I have see, seen two of these questions. Uh, both of these questions are actually to, uh, to Elizabeth Werner. Um, I'll uh, read them out to you, uh, Elizabeth, and uh, for the others as well. Um, and to see what you can say about that. Uh, one question is, uh, what role does DigiMove see for EEOS energy efficiency obligation schemes in road freight, uh, given the huge obligations on oil companies? That is one question. Um, and another question uh, is, uh, you said that the commission is 
technology neutral for solutions for long haul road freight decarbonization. How does that fit with uh, the strategy released this week aiming for 1000 hydrogen stations by 2025? So a very specific question on uh, energy efficiency obligation uh, related to uh, the oil companies and another question uh, that is uh, asking about the, the, the way the strategy is technology neutral whilst at the same time also um, pushing for hydrogen uh, stations. Elizabeth. Thank you. They're difficult question to answer. On the energy efficiency, I do think it is extremely important for when we talk about the fuels. But it's not um, decided at this moment in time whether there should be sectoral targets. Um, clearly, when we look at the different alternative fuels, we see different energy efficiency uh, for different types of vehicles. And I think that must guide us also in, in making certain choices. Um, we also obviously look at the available alternatives and we compare the alternatives that we have for different segments of transport. And then we come to different um, conclusions. And I think this is exactly the reason why our strategy is formulated in the way it is, that we quite clearly see, say that for road transport, in our view, the solutions will be either electricity and or hydrogen um, for, for urban transport. And I know you had a different panel on this. Um, it's, um, I think electricity is really starting to be, um, I don't know, clearly front runner, let me say this. That, um, we can always have a technological leap in another, in another technology and see this changing. But um, for, for the really the heavy vehicles, the long distance vehicles, um, it, I think the call is still out. And that's why we want to not um, take a clear stance on this um, and proceed more with uh, two alternatives that we see right now in parallel. And why do we then have targets for hydrogen stations? Um, basically, we believe that this is a valid technology, um, but it doesn't mean it will be the only technology. And of course, uh, we will be watching also the developments. If new solutions come up, um, we want to be able to flexibly uh, react to this. The hydrogen stations, um, we want to also obviously make sure it's, we're talking about clean hydrogen. And uh, they have an advantage that this is a technology that works for several transport modes. And if we place these stations strategically, I think they can, of course, benefit at the same time, trains, trucks, or even barges. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Now, uh, I'm looking at the time. We have uh, exactly five minutes left. I think it would be uh, great to hear still from, uh, from all of you uh, again, but that can only work, of course, if, if everybody is going to be very, uh, very short. Um, and I basically would like to have the opinion of everyone uh, on, well, on one particular question. Um, basically, hearing all the presentations um, I think there's a lot of a lot of let's say different measures to be taken. Uh, the question is: is there is there consensus, um, and do we know enough? Um, my question to you is: what in your field would you consider to be the biggest open question that needs to be uh, answered to really advance in decarbonizing non-urban freight? So, what is the biggest open question? It can be very very short. Your uh, your answer. Uh, and I'll start with, with, with Laurie to ask him that question. Thank you, Olaf. <clears throat> well, I'm an engineer and I, I work at uh, TU Delft, the, the Technische Universiteit Delft. You see behind me the, uh, the nice building, our library and students in pre-COVID times. We are engineers, we design stuff. So I think it's really um, underestimated that the fact that this is a design exercise. We have to weigh the options, combine them smartly, look at the feasibility, scrutinize them, build up together with the community a sense of what is feasible. 
and and I don't think it's now perceived as a design exercise uh, where all these things have to come together. Uh, your work has just shown that it's possible to evaluate uh, a design when it's there in the high ambition scenario, for example. But making this design is another exercise. I don't think we're approaching it seriously enough. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Laurie. Uh, Alan, to you. Uh, yeah, of course, I'm an academic, spent my life researching this area, and that there's one vitally important bit of information we have constantly lacked, which is on the utilization of vehicles. In, in the ITF report, again, there's some figures on payload weight, but that's not all that helpful. We want to know what payload weight and also the cube of the freight is relative to the capacity of the vehicle, because until we get that data, we don't really know what the potential is for cutting carbon emissions by loading the vehicles better. So a plea to the governments and to the commission to improve the statistical database that we have on the loading of vehicles. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Lucy, what do you consider to be the biggest question to still to be answered? I think just to, I suppose, just to bring some a, a new perspective or new idea adding to, to others, um, I think it's about um, measuring understanding the social impact and social value of our transport system. So it's not just about, we can't look at climate change mitigation in isolation, but what are the social impacts and social value derived from the different modes and the different way that we're investing um, in our transport and, and, and making sure that that transition is just Thank you. Um, Raluca? Yeah, so um, I think it was already said that uh, there is no golden, uh, uh, let's say, no golden key. So uh, there is no golden solution for any or silver bullet for everything. So um, considering everything together, weighing the various um, uh, tools in achieving the result, uh, being realistic, and finding the right incentives for, uh, from the perspective of our sector to embrace uh, the change uh, that, will, that will make it happen. Thank you, Veluca. I'm now turning to Elizabeth. What is for you the biggest open question? The biggest open question is how we can achieve the commitment so that we have the efforts of all the actors to pull in that direction. What we want to do is a transformation of the system, putting ourselves and every mode of transport on a, on a different path. And of course, from our point of view, there is an enabling framework, there is regulation, there is also um, subsidies and investment support, but the effort will be one that has to be carried by European institutions, each and every member state, the authorities at the different levels of government, the businesses and the citizens or the consumers. And this is for me, the real question is, we have a good understanding. We share quite a lot of the analysis that's been shown by um, your scenarios, but how widespread is that common understanding of this sense of urgency and really changing the system. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. And I think the last word is for, for Francisco. What was for you the biggest uh, open question? All of the previous uh, speakers already highlighted very important topics, all of them. I, I would underline one that we in the ITF always uh, talk about, even in other contexts, which is having um, evidence-based policy. And for that, we need also more data. And, we and it was mentioned throughout the, this discussion, sometimes the transparency, clarity, data, even to get the indicators that uh, Alan McKinnon was talking about, to have a better assessment in terms of uh, the logistics sector, in terms of freight movements, of what is being transported, where, when, uh, what are the actual loads, what are the actual emissions. I, I think this, this, um, this work of, because this is a, is, is a sector that's unlike, for instance, urban transport, it's very private oriented. The private sector has traditionally has had a big weight on this. Governments have been 
less interventive. Even in terms of research and methodological research, it lags actually a bit behind. So I think these developments in terms of data, in terms of analysis, and Laurie also mentioned this in terms of the design of the pathways. I think this is, and, but the raw data itself for us to obtain these indicators and to do have better assessment of the different measures, I think this is something that I would highlight. Thank you, many thanks. <clears throat> this uh, ends uh, our session on uh, non-urban uh, urban trade. I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, very much uh, the, the two speakers of this, uh, this session, uh, Laurie and Francisco. Thanks so very much. It was very helpful to have your presentations and, of course, also uh, the four uh, different panelists that we, that we had to the, today, uh, Elizabeth, Lucy, uh, Alan and Raluca. Uh, thanks so much for uh, all your perspectives, uh, your uh, frank answers to, uh, to, to my questions and the questions of the audience. And of course, also uh, a lot of thanks to the audience for their, their participation and interest in this, uh, this session. Um, and hereby, I, uh, I also give back the floor for the uh, closing statements to this, uh, this webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Olaf, and thanks everyone for your participation in this event and this session. Uh, now we move on on the closing remarks, which will be given by Yari Kaupila, the head of quantitative policy analysis and foresight of the ITF. Yari. Thank you, Demetrius. And uh, wow, I, I hope I don't have to try to uh, summarize the two days of, of inspiring and, and really in-depth discussion. So um, maybe I'll just try to say a few words as a closing of, of, of this meeting today. Um, the first I have to say, I'm very, very pleased to hear the overall positive feedback on the work done in this project. Um, I heard words like useful, innovating, and even inspiring. I think these are some of the words that are really uh, are, are appreciated by the team here at the ITF side. So thank you very much for this positive feedback. But of course, uh, I think we also heard um, uh, suggestions for improvements, um, give an example, better integration of passenger and freight in the models, their interaction on the same, same networks on the urban space, for example, or the integration of different sectors into the work we do. Uh, as, and as, as any models, our models are never complete, uh, but we will co co continue improving them to better respond the uh, emerging policy questions and the new technologies and innovations that we see coming up. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I think it would be impossible for me to uh, repeat all the excellent insights, the comments and discussions over the, the two days uh, uh, related to the feasibility of the results and the policy implications of these results specifically. I think there were still uh, some common elements and recurring topics that I picked up over the two days. Um, <clears throat> these are not perhaps surprising, but I think it may be useful to repeat some of them. Um, we need holistic approach. All measures, mix of measures are needed to achieve our ambitions. Uh, technology came up as an important, extremely important part of the solution, but not sufficient alone. We do need the behavioral measures. Uh, I, I, appreciated the point about the design of the of this is a design exercise as well putting all this together uh, I think that's an extremely important part as well um, and and we do not we need to adopt not only multimodal approach to the work but also multi-sector the energy perspectives on this the energy sources well to wheel emissions which need to be addressed as part of the solution as well and I'm, I'm really happy that um, our team is also developing this aspect in our modeling framework as was presented by Francisco as well in the last slides there. Um, but also we should not only look at the CO2 emissions and climate ambitions, but we need to integrate the um, climate objectives with other sustainable development goals, including accessibility, welfare, sustainable growth. Uh, as we are coming out of the pandemic, hopefully very, very soon, um, it is an opportunity to also reshape the transportation sector and, and include some of these environmental components into the uh, stimulus packages, but also other components that would address those other underlying important issues, such as economic recovery as well. Uh, 
I think as a final comment from, from the discussion, for me, the very positive takeaway was that decarbonizing transport is possible. I think that's, that is a positive element underlying all the discussions. Uh, and Europe has a key role as a, as a leader to show also leadership uh, in, the, in the global context. But this requires ambition, this requires political leadership and collaboration across the sectors, across the stakeholders. I think the new European mobility strategy is certainly a, a strong signal of the ambition, the political leadership going forward. But what we also need is to move from the ambition to action and start really scaling up to innovative solutions. And I think there's an urgency for that action uh, as we go year by year forward. And in that context, we are extremely pleased to continue working on this with the European, with the support of the European Commission starting next year with a project that really focuses on implementation and scaling up solutions as uh, Frank Smith from European Commission mentioned yesterday. So what's happening next from the ITF side? Um, the report will be made available on the Commission website, and, and my colleagues correct me if I'm wrong on that, that part. Um, we will also prepare a mini outlook for Europe, a mini outlook in the context that in, in, in May, we will be publishing our flagship publication, ITF Transport Outlook 2021, also with the focus on COVID-19, both short-term and long-term impacts, and, and how those could be used as an opportunity to shape the and so everyone should be publishing a mini outlook based on the work done here, but also on the outlook itself on focused on, on Europe. And of course, we will continue the dissemination and communication activities in relation to this particular project. But more broadly, the ITF's decarbonizing transport initiative will continue, and hopefully provide useful uh, policy support to our member countries and all the stakeholders on effective transport CO2 mitigation measures. In that context, we will also keep updating our Transport Climate Action Directory. Many of you have been involved in the reviewing the measures in that directory. I you and the governments to take a look at what works and under which conditions. So again, thank you all you who've been involved on, on that work already before. And, and I guess finally, it, it's a, a more broader thank you for me uh, from, from ITF side. First of all, I'd like to express uh, our sincere thanks on behalf of the International Transport Forum to the European Commission for enabling this study, decarbonizing transport in Europe I'd like to thank all speakers and participants during the two days of this meeting. Uh, excellent comments, suggestions, and also guidelines for us to improve the work we are doing here at the ITF. But I also like to thank all the participants as a whole, giving us questions, comments in the chat during the two days. But more broadly, also all the people who have been involved in this project over the two years this work would not have been possible without your support and your engagement. And you people know who you are. Many of you are there in the audience and the speakers today. So a huge thank to all of you for your participation. And just finally, I, I do really wanna like to express my, my own special thanks to the fantastic team at the ITF of the great work done on this project and more broadly in decarbonizing transport and not least to Emer Grant, who's the invisible hand behind all the meetings, all the administrative details throughout the two years of this project. Uh, I don't think any of this would have been possible without all of your help. So thank you all. So thank you all once again. I wish you a wonderful afternoon. I hope you stay safe and I really wish you a great upcoming holiday season. So back to you, Dimitris, for any final points I may have missed and you might wanna bring up. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Yari. No, I do not believe you missed something. Uh, uh, that was very interesting remarks. And on my side, I just want to thank everyone, both speakers, uh, participants, panelists, uh, people who organized, and of course, Imer, uh, 
Uh, and with that, we come to the end of this two-day event. Thank you very much for your patience and uh, contributions. Have a great uh, day, weekend, and holidays coming up soon.